Amy Armstead is having an issue with her sound. Laura's having an issue? Amy Armsby. Oh, Amy's having an issue. Okay. Well, as long as she can hear us right now, that's good. Um, all right. Welcome, everybody, to this ad hoc housing element committee special meeting. Um, Tuesday, May 24th. It's just past 7.30, and we're going to get going. Uh, I think, Laura, do you want to do the roll call, please? Yes, um, Jeff Alps. Here. Amy Armsby um, is having trouble with her sound, but I'm indicating on the record that she's here. Sarah Dorhe. Yeah. Eric Doyle. Here. Bill Kelly. Here. Ann Koff Sill. Here. Andrew Pierce. Here. Al Sill. Here. Nicholas Targ will be absent this evening. He sends his apologies. Um, Bob Turcott. Here. Janie Ward. Here. Sarah Wernikoff. Here. Helen Walter. Here. And Chair MacArthur. I am here. All right. Um, we will start with oral communications. I'm just gonna read from the agenda. Persons wishing to address the ad hoc housing element committee on any subject not on the agenda may do so now. Please note, however, that the ad hoc housing element committee is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Comments will be limited to two minutes per person. Okay, and we have at the moment 68, nope, sorry. 50 people from our community participating. I wanna welcome everybody. Thank you for participating. Um, all right, so these are comments on items not on the agenda, please. So Walter Evans, you're up first. <clears throat> Walter? Looks like we're having a little trouble getting. Yeah, just a second. Queued up, yeah. There. yeah. Okay, we're all set, Walter Evans. All right, go for it, Walter. Are you unmuted? Yep. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. I apologies for that. Um, okay. I'm just trying to, as we go through this process. I want to make sure that the council is really taking into account the town plan and, you know, understand the motivations for going above the state requirements for units. Um, so I'm not necessarily thinking that we, given the culture of Portola Valley, why are in, in the goals of being a rural community, why we're aiming to go above the requirements set out by the state when we already have a, you know, we don't need to have overpopulation to impact the wildlife of the area. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're taking that into account. The council's following the town plan uh, when it's making these decisions, which isn't listed in the goals uh, that are being used to implement this. So just wanna point that out and make sure we're following the town plan. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline Vertongan, go ahead. Caroline? It's just taking us a second to get everyone oh, switched in. It. I'm sorry. So impatient here on the East Coast. <laughs> All right. Hi, Caroline. Go ahead. Uh, you need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go. Thank you. Um, I have a question and I would like confirmation on that and then I have some comments. Can you confirm that um, my concerns were distributed to all the members of the committee, the concerns that I had submitted to Laura and to yourself and to the whole committee in April? And then second, um, I agree with uh, Walter and many other residents. I just saw your um, 
the ad hoc elements, committees, charge values and approach to decorum and public comments. And let me say you, um, when it comes to, okay, we all agree with the committee's charge, but then number two, the housing element that reflects the town values and goals. I have not seen that, I'm sorry. Incorporate best possible planning for safety considerations. I'm sorry, we're beyond that. We should have had safety implemented because we have the guidelines in our old general plan. So committee values, yes, support diversity, equity, and inclusivity. We always have done that. Family friendly community, yes. And we can work on that because right now we only have 10% of residents who are in our public schools, 20% in our private school. Planning for housing that is mindful of PV's role character. I don't see that with the new sites that you have allocated. I'm sorry, you're taking away our, our rural character. Uphold the town safety considerations. I'm sorry, you're behind on our safety. You're way behind. Okay, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Okay, next up we've got Rebecca Lim. Um, through the chair, just so that you know, there's something weird going on on Zoom for us behind the scenes, trying to oh. allow people to give their public comments. Okay. And we're trying to sort it out, but just so that you know, it's a little bit. Okay. Different. Okay. Sorry if you hear that. Hey, how are you? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the first two comments. I mean, I've looked through the town master plan and I just struggle to even see how the current recommendation in any way supports it. And the second thing is um, I was a little disappointed that the committee removed the list of houses that voluntarily upzoned. I understand that, you know, there's the net horse and there's also the Georgia Lane uh, parcels and they're suddenly uh, gone from the website. I think they're on the webinar still. So I think that remains, that should be public and people should- Can I just remind people just to keep comments to things that are not on the agenda. So nothing happened. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't see that on the agenda because I didn't, I didn't see it on the agenda because yeah. I, well, I didn't see is, the list. Okay, we're we're okay, talking so about ADUs and opt-in and the uh, overall site plan. What I'm pointing out is you've dropped something from the agenda that should be present. This is not the time to talk about what we've got on the agenda. We'll have a time later. Like to I do said, that. it's not on the agenda. Yeah. And the third thing is that I think it's kind of ridiculous that we're not in person at this point. This is such an amazing uh, problem and, and challenge for the town. I think it needs overall buy-in. Other towns, including Woodside, have been back in person for a very long time. And I think it's a little um, disingenuous for us not to be meeting in person and actually meeting with the community that will be impacted. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Karen Askey, you're up next. I just want to remind people that anything having to do with stuff that's on the agenda. So we're talking about ADU, joint ADUs, opt-in programs, anything having to do with the site selection, the how, you know, all that where you can take, have a chance to make a comment later on in the meeting when we get to those items. Mm -hmm. Karen, go ahead. Hi. Um, Hey, uh, this has sort of come up by Rebecca, but as we know, since you had your last meeting, some neighboring communities have come out with their draft plans. And I had asked in the last meeting, what sorts of conversations are we having with those communities, whether it's Woodside, who's increased their ADU numbers, or Atherton, who has a large percentage? Have we talked to Los Altos Hills? I think it's really important that we be doing that. And I don't think we've heard much about what might be going on in those conversations. And then Jocelyn, are you ever coming back from the East Coast? We miss you out here. Great, thanks. <laughs> Do you have any other comments? No. Okay, great, thank you. David Cardinal, go ahead. Uh, sure, I, I think this is off topic or off uh, agenda since it was referred to before, but through the chair, my understanding, and this is either a comment or a question, is the reason that we are looking at more potential housing sites than the minimum required is because we have to make a legitimate, realistic plan. And if we only plan for the minimum and any of them don't succeed, then we would have to backtrack and add more. So I just want to get a clarification on whether my understanding is correct per the earlier question that was asked. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next up, we've got Rita Comas. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my comment. This is something that's not on the agenda, which is the infrastructure of this town, the aging infrastructure. Uh, I'm sure when there's building going on, new building, uh, they will get conduits for wireless and phones and gas lines and electrical lines. But for all of the rest of us, 1,600 people in the town, um, we're having problems. I had a review at my alarm company last week and they couldn't figure out why I'm in Portola Valley. You know, one of the nicest towns in the area. They couldn't figure out why there were so many interruptions because my electrical system went down so many times in the past year. And then my phone lines went down so many times in the past year. They were dumbfounded and, and so am I, I had no answers. But it reminded me that we need an infrastructure plan for the rest of us and for these new people that are coming in. But I don't see that as part of anything. And how are we going to do all these things if we don't have the basic, basic infrastructure for this aging process that we have in this town? You know, and where are they going to tap into the water? You know, and what's going to happen with the um, with the government? The the governor just said this is the worst in what a couple of hundred years. This drought. Where is that going to come from? And I don't see that incorporated in this plan. And we need to incorporate infrastructure into these plans or we won't be able to move forward with any plan at all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I just wanna point out to Dylan that we've got Caroline Vertonghen appearing on the, uh, the committee panelists. Yeah, that's, so we, that's the glitch that we had. Okay. Um, so we have two members of the public that are sort of stuck in the panelists right now. And so Caroline Vertongen and Rebecca Lynn, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to move you back in to the members of the public, but if something happens, please accept my apologies. And if you get dropped for some reason, please rejoin the webinar. So we're really sorry about that. Thanks, Laura. Okay. Um, all right, Bob Adams. Taking comments on things not on the agenda, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it's this has to do with the last meeting and the last meeting that moved very fast at the end. And at the at the end, for some reason, the uh, town center uh, low income housing got dropped off the list. And I'd like to make sure it gets on the list uh, as being a potential site if we need that location. Uh, there could be eight very low income housing units put there, and I just like to make sure that it's included. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other public comment at this point? I don't see any, so we can move on to our next section. Okay, so um, the uh, Committee of Committees had another meeting and we've got Judith Murphy, who's the chair, who's gonna uh, present an overview of that meeting that happened on May 16th. And I know she's here. Um, Judy, could you raise your hand? There she is. Got it, all right. Okay, so we're just making Judy a panelist so that we can see her if she wants to have her camera on. Great, Judy, hi, welcome to the meeting. Um, I guess before you start, I'm just wondering if you're gonna like last time provide an overview, like a summary that, that could get passed out to the committee. Uh, I'm sorry, can you unmute please? I can't hear you. In once, I will again. There okay. we go. That. Okay, yeah. great, thanks, okay. Uh, yes, I will do, uh, I'll do that. That was um, really helpful, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Committee of committees met on May 16th. There were seven town committees in attendance. All 11 standing committees had been invited. There were 23 members of the public uh, also in attendance. Uh, summary presentation of progress made so far on the housing element update uh, by Director of Planning Laurel Russell was followed by committee representatives asking questions and making comments. And then the public was invited to ask questions and make comments. Uh, there are many comments, and uh, those include uh, many of those comments are folded into my report. 
uh, we discussed one another's requests and recommendations. Um, what I'm saying now today is not minutes. I bunched things um, together that were said at different times in the meeting to sort of streamline the report and try to be as efficient as I can so I don't take up too much time. But still wanting to give you a general sense of the meeting and the diversity of things that happened. Anybody who wants the full blow by blow can go to a recording of those <laughs> that meeting that we had. It's on the town's website. So most mentioned was safety. Many committees had specific safety concerns, as did many residents. There are so many risks that need consideration, fire, seismic, geologic. Um, issues mentioned were handling and increased traffic volumes while protecting pedestrian safety, protecting safety on trails from encroachment and construction, adequacy of infrastructure for evacuation, adequate infrastructure for water, cable, et cetera. All in many ways, landscape, hardscape, and siting design can maximize fire prevention and safety. There was consensus in our last meeting that the safety element should not be subservient to or lag behind the housing element process. This was strongly expressed again. The public part of that process with committees agendas, agendizing the staff produced first draft and opportunities for resident input has actually just begun. So we're starting to see this roll out into committees and people who say it's not happening at all. In fact, it has been, the staff's been doing their part and now it's rolling out into the public part. Um, but Committee on Committees recommends that the housing element not be final, final, finalized until the safety element has been um, relatively finalized. And that may mean in the second iteration, this goes, the state comes back, goes again. Um, preservation of the unique qualities of Portola Valley. Uh, the town was created specifically to preserve and enhance the natural quality of the area, its semi-rural atmosphere and its view of the Western Hills. It's also one of the primary mandates given to this committee, your committee, to find a way to create opportunities for additional housing while respecting the natural rustic ambiance of the town. Increased housing could destroy this, or it could fit relatively unobtrusively in, depending on the zoning, design, and planning code changes that are enacted. There's an inherent conflict between the logic of putting most development along major transportation corridors and the fact that those same roads are our dedicated scenic corridors. Specific setbacks for building exist, but there are no official setbacks for hardscape. And so parking can extend all the way to the front of the property line. This has been mentioned before. No landscaping at all is required and is totally legal. So Laura, can you screen share that photo that I sent you? So this is um, taken on Alpine Road, the building that is coming down so that the willows can go in. And you can tell from where I was, I was standing on the edge of the road. You can see the trail coming in on the right. So the so the right of way extends to the far edge of the trail. And then it's just hardscape as far as the eye can see. That is totally legal according to the current plan. So if we're gonna do a lot of development along Alpine Road, we wanna be very careful that we don't, that Portola Road doesn't look like that as we change it. There are ways to get housing along there that um, don't create this um, stranded in the asphalt look. Um, to prevent the mini mall look along the scenic corridor, there should be codified a six to eight foot setback for hardscape and a mandated vegetation barrier between the road and the parking. Some additional landscaping should be required in front of the building. No building should be permitted to block existing views of the Western Hills. None of this is in the current design guidelines and it needs to be added as we proceed. Also remember that roads are gonna be widened. And there's a lot of talk about that as we look at evacuation needs and concerns about safety. If roads are gonna be widened, anything built with the current required setbacks will then be nearer the edge of the road and will not have the usual scenic setback. So we would uh, implore that no variances to required setbacks should be allowed. If anything, denser projects should be required to sit further back from the scenic corridor to minimize their negative visual impact both now and in the future. 
our trails are at the heart of the pleasure and the privilege of living in Portola Valley. Nothing should be changed that puts our trails at risk. Protection of trails should be increased as much as possible. It's inappropriate to allow buildings or fences or construction vehicles to block the trails. If roads are widened to meet increased traffic and evacuation needs, both the Alpine Trail and the Portola Valley and the Portola Road Trail might disappear. How can we protect them? How can we make sure that those trails continue to exist as development proceeds? Um, parks and open spaces should be fiercely protected from development, if at all possible. State laws now prohibit creating parks to avoid building housing. So it might be nearly impossible to create new parks in town in the future. It's cavalier to say that use one now and make another one later as we get more land. There's, that's, that's become a very difficult thing. We could have done that in the past, but now it, it's a very difficult thing to envision actually happening. There was much resistance to building on any of our public park lands, while some thought it was inevitable, as in your committee, our committee <laughs> had varying views on that. Demands on fields and courts will have been increasing despite a stable population. They'll be under increased strain with increased use for increased population. The town should not be merely protecting our parks and open spaces and fields, but proactively looking for ways to increase them if possible. Concerns were voiced about putting dense housing immediately next to playing fields with the detrimental effects on field overuse, overflow parking, and so on. Felt strongly that a variety of locations should be authorized, while larger multifamily projects should be more central. All neighborhoods should be expected to make a contribution to complying with the mandate for increased housing. A well-designed fourplex can masquerade as a new mansion with very little visual impact in a larger lot neighborhood. And new all low-income development should not be separated and set off. It would be bad for the social fabric of the town to put all the low-income housing in one area and create a new wrong side of the tracks. The most effective way to uh, effectively distribute low-income housing throughout the town is with ADUs. Horses have been an essential part of Portola Valley since its founding. Hasn't been much talk about horses to date, but thought should be given to protecting some of the more visible boarding facilities, not just to benefit the horse, or, horse, horse owners, <laughs> but because they add open space and contribute to the rural aesthetic. Virtually every decision you make will impact the natural ambiance of the town. Please remember this, even it seems peripheral as you consider individual items. Sustainability has become a core value of the town. Smaller units should be supported. They are much more sustainable. More efficient use of square footage should be allowed and encouraged, such as co-housing, communal housing, pocket neighborhoods. We haven't heard much about those things as we develop the site plan. Alternative forms of transportation should be pursued. The commercial district should be protected. No major rebuild on our commercial buildings that would raise the rent on current small business owners and potentially drive them out of business should be approved. Affiliate housing there should be not merely permitted, but encouraged. Uh, you should be thinking in terms of systems rather than individual items. And there's a number of these. A transportation system. As our bus availability decreases for lack of ridership, how can we meet the transportation needs of more residents, especially low-income residents? With fewer parking spaces allotted to new denser housing, should we require a zip car space at, at the larger uh, projects? If the wedge brings more Stanford people to town, should we negotiate a marguerite route here as part of the package? A staging system so that major projects get done sequentially and there's not great overload on the main routes through town if multiple large projects are happening at once is very important. Some, some roads in town experience this on a mini level where you know a road will have four or five houses being built at the same time and the residents there are enormously impacted. And it's hard to imagine Alpine Road under those situations. So we really hope there'd be some sort of a systematic uh, staging system for these projects. Once again, systematic trails. Construction often blocks trails. Planning department and building inspectors should make sure that this does not happen. If the roads get widened to meet concerns about increased traffic, 
and evacuation needs, how do we protect our trails? They should not be an afterthought, but central to all the planning decisions that get made. Every plot you look at should be thinking about the trails that are there. And then the system of the scenic corridor. Think about the scenic corridor as a whole system, rather than just isolated parcels along those roads that must meet setback requirements. What's our experience driving into town along Alpine Road? And what would be the cumulative effect of including all those proposed parcels along here? So it's not just one plus one equals two, it's, it's one plus one may equal an impact of five because they're in such a critical place. Importantly, we thought you should do nothing irrevocable until absolutely necessary. Since downzoning is no longer allowed and some moderation of requirements might come in the next few years if, uh, if uh, some people had their wishes, we should move very slowly on projects that will permanently destroy open vistas, heritage trees, et cetera. Fast track the least visually damaging projects like scattered ADUs and drag your feet on the ones where great damage will be done. Many of the details we care about are not measures that your committee will be making decisions about in this current focus on site selection. But we expect that you will have follow-up meetings on zoning changes, design guidelines, general plan changes. Many of the items I've reported on that were, that were issues of concern to both committees and residents will be important to be remembered and to, for you to incorporate, or incorporate them in those discussions and as you go forward. The devil will be in the details as the general plan, zoning, planning, design guidelines are all revised. Once we move past the where, the how becomes vitally important. Uh, let's see, I've lost the page here. Both committees and residents felt strongly that they should be included early in the revisions of all those pieces. We want to be helping to craft those documents as was done by residents early in the town when those documents were created, not just to be asked to comment on documents created by staff and consultants. Any consultants hired should be encouraged to include discussions with at least a few residents to avoid the missteps created by not having knowledge of the history or the culture of the town. There are many experienced, knowledgeable, and overly educated residents who can participate in the drafting, evaluating, and planning. Because they've chosen to live here, they'll be able to make uniquely valuable suggestions that expensive outside consultants sometimes cannot. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Judy. I appreciate the summary and all that good input. Um, okay, so Laura, we're gonna go on to the next section. Is that right? Um, you should see if there's any questions from the committee um, for Judy. Okay, any questions for Judy? Bob, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks for that excellent presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate just a little bit on um, what you mean by pocket neighborhoods. I can guess what that is, but um, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's small clusters of co like cottages that share um, a, a, a yard, sometimes laundry facilities, et cetera. It's a way of having a home that's your own private. It's not quite co-housing, but it's close. Some people call them cottage neighborhoods, small cottage neighborhoods. Is the idea that the units are all on the same parcel or is it um, small parcels clustered together? Uh, I think it could be either the way that this your planning is going. It looks like it's it's if they were to be on various parcels, the the various parcel owners would have to be cooperating and doing it together. Okay. And that Thank might you. be needed if it was going to be um, if we have to have uh, two ways out from anything that has more than a single house. Then um, that's that's the major stumbling block. Other, otherwise, it's they've been done remarkably well all over the country. Thanks. Go ahead, Sarah. Judy, 
One question I have, I was I was on that committee meeting also, and I know that you have attended a lot of the ad hoc housing element committee meetings, Judy. So you've been kind of along for the ride and see the path of why we've gotten where we are at this point. Um, my sense is, you know, there there was a lot of great feedback, but a lot of it had been kind of considered along the way um, through this process with the ad hoc housing element committee. And we've had to deal with the constraints and the reality of the demands of the solutions that we actually have to find. And so I'm curious from your perspective, um, were there new ideas that you thought we could implement? Because a lot of the things, many of the things that were suggested are a challenge to implement because we have to find you know, we have to come up with this number. So, you know, of course, I think a lot of people would agree with a lot of your statements that you just made. But if we did that, we wouldn't be able to get to our number. So knowing what you know, do you think that what kind of rises to the top from from your perspective as the feedback that is actually actionable, given that we have to get this, uh, you know, 300 plus number of units? So uh, I'm just the messenger here. No, 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 I'm curious for your <laughs> No, I, I understand. And so our meeting, like your meeting, had uh, enormous amounts of redundancy in it and that people speak about their concerns and their worries. And there's, there's much less actual uh, new creative outside the box. Thing. Why don't we think about doing this kind of things brought to the table? And I wish there were more of that. I wish, I wish some of this energy was going into people really um, examining or evaluating or looking around for other things. I think that what rises to the top, both from in that meeting and, and discussions all around is that um, ADU, that ADUs are the, that the town would prefer to have it done all with ADUs if they could. So anybody who's been involved in all these committee meetings knows why that's not really possible, but people continue to believe it should, it could be possible, it should be possible if we really got off our duffs and enlisted people to you know, put in for permits right now, we could prove that there's an interest, et cetera. So I would say the, the strongest feeling has to do with ADUs. And I think the, the biggest roadblock is the one that, that you all understand very well is that most of what gets built here can't be low-income housing just because of the way it pencils out. So the only way for us to get credit for having low-income housing is to do something high density because there's a presumption on the part of the state that it will be low income. And, and that's, that's the mountain you have to climb. So <laughs> yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of new new, new, new ideas. So the main thing that was new was the suggestion that we'd be thinking in terms of systems, which I like very much. That sort of focused um, our discussion once it came up because a lot of these things fall into place in terms of various systems. And I think it is important to be thinking um, sort of holistically and ecologically about what we do rather than just saying, oh, we can put this here, we can put that there, we can put that there without looking at how they interact or, or accumulate. I would agree with that. That was that was a takeaway I had as well. Thank you. Okay. Hey, any other questions for Judy from the committee? From Sarah D. <clears throat> Question for Judy, um, or maybe just a comment. I think uh, when you talk about how well-designed fourplex could look just like any of the mansions we have around here, anyway, that's a you know that's a really important point that we have plenty of very large buildings in Portola Valley already. Um, so if we, we know they're already here. So we just have to think about how we, you know, have parameters so that if we are building in a, in a way that's more dense, that nothing is gonna be bigger than, or, or taller than <laughs> what exists already. Uh, I mean, a million years ago, and this is a bad example because if anyone's been to Bali lately, they'll know it didn't pan out that way, but. When we were there in the 70s, the, um, the uh, region at the time said no hotel should be taller than the tallest palm tree. So if we think about that and ignore what actually happened to Bali and hope it doesn't happen to Portola Valley, <laughs> you know, no, maybe no building should be no bigger than what we have already. That's my comment. I think that's why it's so important to keep in mind the view of the Western Hills 
that that's an easy benchmark. No building should block the view of the Western Hills. Not, it's the palm tree, it's our palm tree equivalent. <laughs> Any other questions for Judy? Okay. Um, so Laura, we're taking it now to the community. Yes, public comments specifically on Judy's presentation. All right, you heard it there. Rita Comas, you're up. Uh, Judy, I just want to thank you so much for your um, report. I, I feel that your report really captured what had happened and what was said in that meeting by the residents of this wonderful town. And I hope that it is widely distributed uh, with all the consultants, not just the consultants that are working on the housing element, but the ones that are working on the safety element and, and anybody else that gets paid by this town needs to read that report because it is really the voice of the people of this town. So I thank you personally for your report and just putting all of the stuff that people said and capturing it so nicely in the report. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline Vertonghen, you're up next. Thank you, Judy. You, you did it all. You're a mentor, um, and I hope many people will follow your example. So thank you very much. Thank you. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing. Ioni? Oh, um, hi, this is Lonnie. Not Lonnie, a it's a small L. Go ahead, Lonnie. Um, I just wanted to echo, I, I um, have been trying to find the agenda and I can't find it. So I, I wasn't sure who Judith uh, was representing, but wow, thank you so much for that summary. Um, and I wanted to just speak to the fact that Sarah had asked her what is new or notable with her suggestion. And one of the takeaways um, that I hope the town has from all of this is this idea that Judith presents of starting slowly things can change and we should try to do the lower impact projects first. I just wanted to um, raise that thought. Thank you. So just for anybody who's looking for the agenda, you can go to the portolavalley.net website and click on housing element. Somewhere in there, there's um, meeting agendas. <clears throat> um, and just again, Judy is the chair of the committee of all committees <laughs> ever created in Portola Valley. <laughs> All right, uh, Karen Askey, you're up. Yeah, I just want to thank Judy, uh, just like the others have, that that was a fabulous summary and recap and really did represent all of us. Um, and I think another thing she mentioned that I just wanted to speak to is that uh, I think a lot of us are concerned about overdevelopment. So when we have a, a site slated for 50, but with bonus density laws that could become, I don't know, 70 or 72, and we have 300 in our plan, um, we're going over by 253. And we can't, my understanding is, is we can't change that rezoning once we've done it. And so that we do need to move slowly and make sure that we do not allow for overdevelopment in this next time period. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I think that's it for public comment on that. Um, okay, so we're gonna move to the number two on the agenda, um, which is a staff presentation and committee discussion um, all around the partial draft housing element. I'm gonna turn it over to Laura and team. Thank you, Judy, very much for helping us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, does that look okay to everyone? Okay, if there's someone that still doesn't know me, I'm Laura Russell, I'm the Planning and Building Director. Um, thank you for joining us um, for this important meeting. So this is a presentation to go over some highlights related to the partial draft housing element update um, that we released with the agenda packet um, for this meeting last Friday. So the meeting format is our customary format. Um, I'll give the staff presentation and then there'll be committee questions for staff and our consultant. Then we'll have public comments and then we'll come back for committee discussion. 
So the goal for today's meeting is for the committee and the public to provide feedback on the partial draft housing element with a particular focus on the new programs and policies, especially related to ADUs and JADUs, the new opt-in and the new opt-in single family rezoning program that we proposed. So here's some meeting updates for those that haven't been involved in the whole process. The last meeting of this committee was on May 2nd. It was the fifth time that this committee looked at the housing sites inventory and discussed it. Staff presented additional maps and analysis. We gave updates on recent meetings that were held related to ADUs and the opt-in up zoning. The committee then discussed two possible sites inventory scenarios and ended up going with scenario number one, which is a more dispersed scenario, but then made some modifications um, through the course of that conversation. The materials for these meetings, um, on the, all these past meetings are on the town's website. Um, we've been a little short staffed with vacation and people out due to illness and some family issues. So we're still getting some things posted, but lots of things will keep getting posted as we move forward. Then on May 9th, there was a community-wide meeting. We had just over 100 participants um, that were on Zoom together. We gave a staff presentation, and then we went into breakout rooms to hear the feedback of those small groups of people. And so here's some of the highlights, the overview of that feedback that we received. There was concern about how the site selection and that dispersed approach might relate to evacuation routes and fire hazards. There was concern about the opt-in sites. People asked what criteria had been used to select them, what would happen in the future, and talked about neighborhood impacts. There was an overall preference, um, we thought generally speaking, for a dispersed approach to meet the RENA requirements. There was, um, as always, consensus around maintaining rural character and low density of development. There was an interest in having cottage or townhouse style designs in neighborhood sites, as opposed to something that could be um, taller or more massive. And the idea was to maintain existing heights and setbacks. People also talked about dark sky, noise, and utility requirements to maintain the character of the town. Um, lots of conversation around scenic corridors, heritage and significant trees, and maintenance of open space. There were concerns about parking, both the number of parking spaces that would be required with projects, like would there be enough parking with projects, and also the visual impact of parking that would have to be developed and able to serve those projects a lot of awareness around the fact that there's very little available street parking in many of the places that we've been talking about. There was conversation about how the housing should meet the needs of the workforce and provide options for both ownership and rental where that's possible. There's an interest, um, a big interest, Judy hit on this also, in having more ADUs to meet the RENA. So um, having more ADUs as a, as a portion of the RENA requirements. And then some specifics we've talked about before, like amnesty program and tools to streamline and um, reduce the cost of ADUs. And then a request for additional ADU resources and access to information. So handouts, website, those types of things. Then Judy just talked about the Committee of Town Committees on May 16th. Um, from a staff perspective, this was really valuable feedback. You just heard what a wonderful summary it was. Um, many of the things that they suggested are related to the development standards that will be adopted um, with the housing element. So they're not really the big picture housing element things, they're more to think about as we go down the line. And all of the committees will have the option of reviewing the draft housing element with their full committees in June if they would like to do that. So now I'm gonna to turn to an update on the site's inventory analysis. So what we talked about last time and what's been happening since that last conversation. So the first area we're gonna talk about is related to the Nathoros Triangle area. And overall, the committee expressed um, some concerns around concentrating too much development in that area and discussed also having one property at 20 units per acre if it was needed in order to comply um, with the numbers. 
So right now, the way that it's drafted that's in front of you, there are three sites that are included with mixed use and a residential density of six units per acre. Um, we have had very recent conversations with the owner of the vacant property at 4394 Alpine. This is the vacant site next to Roberts. And they asked the committee con to consider 20 units per acre for that site with mixed use so that there would be flexibility for a future project um, and could help the town um, meet some of its requirements. So I wanted to pass that on to you as recent information that we've received. The next topic area is related to ADUs and junior ADUs. So the committee was in favor of increasing the number of ADUs as long as we felt like there was a reasonable justification um, to establish those higher numbers and to be able to provide that rationale. So the number of ADUs was increased from 87 in the last version. Previously we had 80, then went up to 87, and now we're at 92 units. And we've added some ADU and junior ADU incentive programs um, into the text to try to provide additional justification for those. Next is related to the opt-in sites. And so this is an area where we try to take all of the feedback that's come into us um, and try to find a way to move forward that um, address some of that feedback that we'd received. So the committee um, back and forth has had some reservations about the opt-in sites as you've been talking about them, but you elected to keep them as part of the overall approach at your last meeting um, as part of a dispersed um, scenario. Then we received um, some concerns at the community meeting about that, um, the process, the timing, the criteria for the selection, and what would happen in the future meaning were these the only sites that could ever opt in? Would anyone else have a chance? How would we address some of those questions? So those are some of the things that were coming in both directly to me as well as at the community, um, community meeting. So our team got together to think about and kind of analyze ways that we could keep the basic concepts of that approach um, and then try to develop a program that would mitigate some of the concerns that had come up along the way as we were talking about it. So what we have written up and what we propose for your consideration um, is that we removed the specific opt-in sites from the site inventory at this time. Um, we still need about 18 units um, in the above moderate income category. So we created a program in section seven of the partial draft housing element to try to meet this need for the number of units, um, still have a dispersed approach, and have a way that we could um, have a more thoughtful um, approach to the opt-in sites. And I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail um, in just a minute when we get there. So in terms of what's before the committee and what's available to the public right now, um, we have four sections that have been published that we're receiving feedback on right now. That's the introduction and the housing needs assessment. So that's where all the demographic data is. And then there's two really um, meaty sections that you have that the sites with the site inventory discussion and section seven, which is the goals, policies and programs. And those sections really work together to describe to the community, to HCD, you know, to the future, um, what does the town see for itself in terms of housing? That, that's those two sections really go together. You're also seeing a transition in the way that we're providing you materials. So we are now changing it into the format that's more formal um, and providing you the tables and the information that are gonna be in the format for the final housing element draft and what we're gonna submit to HCD. So you're seeing that shift and you'll see some of it, um, you know, we have to change the format to meet some of their requirements. So we've tried to keep things easy to understand. We know how complicated this is. Um, so we're trying to give you tables in both formats in your staff memo. And just as a note, um, everyone, please kind of try to focus on the content. We know that editing and proofreading is left to do. So there's little mistakes. Um, we're sorry about that. We normally wouldn't do that, but we're trying to keep things on schedule and get them out in front of the public. So we know there's little stuff like that that we need to clean up. So this is the site inventory table. 
So there's two places that you can see it if you're following along with the staff report that's available online. So on our staff reports, there's what we call the red page number in the upper right hand corner, and that numbers the packet from start to finish. So if you have it printed or electronically, on red page seven, you can see a summary of this table. Or on red page 52, you can see the detailed version of this table. So depending on what level of detail you're looking for, those are two places that you can look to follow along with, with what I'm going through. So this table is in a little bit different format, but the same type of information that we've been talking about all along. So our base RENA allocation is across the top. And now we're organizing the sites according to the HCD criteria that we have to use. So in terms of our resources that we're projecting forward, we have our pipeline and pending projects. That's the same that we've been talking about. Then we have our projected ADU development. This number is up by a few units, as I mentioned. Then we have vacant sites. So we have Ford Field and we have the vacant um, site at Mathorst. When we say C, D, and E here, it refers to the map that's in the draft um, housing element that you have. Then for non-vacant sites, we have the Glen Oak Stanford property with the numbers, um, basically what we've been talking about before, but allocated those units across the income categories. And then for the Nathworth D and E sites, those are both of the six units per acre um, that the committee was talking about previously. Then we have the Sequoias affiliated housing site with those the five moderate income workforce units and 18 above moderate. Um, we've had some conversations, um, not detailed yet, but with Christ Church, which is adjacent to this property here at Town Center. They had previously indicated an interest in doing five or six units at the back of their property. So they did say that we could include them now in the affiliated housing um, program. So there's some details to be worked out there, but that's a new number that the committee and the public have not seen before. Then for Ladera Church, um, we're gonna add them to the affiliated housing program and also upzone their property. And I've circled here a mistake, a literal mistake um, that we made in preparing this. And so their site is only going to be able to accommodate 10 units because it's half of an acre. So we just accidentally added it in both columns of the very low and the low income. So what I have circled there are the mistakes that we'll need to correct. And then you can see the total, total unit potential for that category of very low, likely to go from 58 down to 48. And then across the bottom, we're showing the buffer um, a different way here than we have in some of the other um, tables that we've given you. And so this buffer that's pretty high at 38% will go down to be almost exactly um, 20% once we fix this and move a couple of numbers around. So I did wanna make sure the committee and the public understand that we still have a little bit of fine tuning to do. I would say sort of, um, if you can see my cursor, sort of the middle of this table, we're still moving a few units around and making sure all the numbers work because this is like a puzzle trying to put it together, especially because our ADU allocation needs to follow a formula um, that we anticipate HCD being able to support so there's a, a proportion, a relationship of the ADUs across the categories. So we need to fine tune this a little bit um, so that these numbers line up and then we'll see uh, the buffer numbers come down a little bit um, in a couple of categories, at least one. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about policies and programs. Um, first, specifically about ADUs and JADUs. So we've received a lot of questions about this from committee members, from the public. This is a really important topic, so I wanted to help clarify for people. Um, if we use HCD, that's Housing and Community Development, that's the state agency that has to certify our housing element to be in compliance with state law. Their recommended method is just to take the average of the last four years of ADUs and use that as your projection moving forward. If we do that uh, strictly according to their method, then that would only be 56 units that we would be including. Right now, our proposal is 92. So that's a significant increase over their strict methodology. There is some risk in staff's opinion um, with going with this higher number of ADUs. 
Um, it's our opinion that it's a reasonable risk um, to take given the community's priorities. So we'll present a rationale to HCD, um, explain the policies and programs, and also talk about the increase in ADUs that we've seen in this calendar year, 2022, um, to kind of demonstrate that our ADU production is going up over time with the pandemic year really being um, you know, hard hit for our planning and building department compared to larger cities that were able to operate much more close to normal during 2020. So we've compiled the different um, ADU programs and policies from different places and tried to bring them together here. So I don't think any of these are brand new, but there might be some different language or different organization around them. So the first is to improve public information. So this is the application and permit process, make it easier to understand, um, simpler for homeowners to go through. Create an amnesty program for existing unpermitted ADUs. We wanna provide direct assistance from the building division for property owners that want to create a JADU. So think about this as if you just need to add a small efficiency kitchen, put up a, a small dividing wall, an exterior door or an emergency egress window. We wanna expedite those minor permits to make it easier for people to make those small changes to accommodate a junior ADU. We wanna establish staff and consultant office hours so applicants can ask questions from subject matter experts. So the example I have here is the town geologist who's truly a subject matter expert. So instead of having to go through emails and back and forth and all that commotion to get their feedback, we could set up some office hours that people could pop into and be able to ask those types of questions. Continuing on on ADU um, programs, um, the next one goes back to conversations that this committee had, now it's months ago, um, but you'll remember we talked about having a survey of ADU owners in town so that we know how much ADUs are being used, um, how they're being distributed and rented to different income levels, and if they're really contributing to affordable housing. So this is something that would be happening in the future um, once the housing element is adopted, kind of an ADU monitoring program. And then next is to develop an affordable ADU rental program. So these are the two specific ideas that we have um, for your consideration. So the first is to have a program that matches landlords with people that are willing to rent ADUs at below market rents. Um, so we have preliminary conversations with Hip Housing, which is a nonprofit that does this. We think it will work out with them. Um, a lot of people get displaced from their rental units just because prices have gone up or the owner is trying to maximize their profit. So we wanna to try to find a way to connect those people with affordable ADUs. And then based on our research from best practices, we've heard a lot of people say that one way to um, easily rent to lower income residents is to go through the housing choice voucher program. So this is what was previously called section eight. And the reason that's easier is because then nobody has to do an income verification or get into someone's personal records or personal business, because if they qualify for a voucher, then we then the homeowner already knows um, that they meet the income restrictions. So we're thinking about ways to do that, that may be things like financial incentives. Um, it could be, um, you know, some kind of other uh, work with a nonprofit. So trying to think about what those different incentives could be for those types of ADUs. So next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, well, quite a bit, about the opt-in single family rezoning. So this is what we came up with um, instead of having the specific sites listed on the housing inventory on the, on the specific list. So we would create a new voluntary upzoning program that would allow property owners to develop up to six units per acre. And the criteria, just the draft criteria for that would be sites of one acre or greater to make sure that we could still have um, setbacks for fire safety. And then the criteria we've talked about before in our constraints analysis. So two points of ingress and egress, slopes less than 30%, outside of a very high fire severity zone as adopted by the town council. So this is to say specifically, we know new maps are gonna be coming out. And when those maps come out, it would apply. Um, to this program. 
outside of a fault zone and outside of areas identified with unstable soils or landslide or liquef liquefaction risk. And the idea here is the broad outline of the program would be in the housing element itself. And then the criteria could be more specifically detailed in the municipal code, like many of our different requirements are. And then we would be writing that right now as part of all of this so that the program could be adopted by January of 2023 and all go into an effect um, together with the housing element, with the safety element, everything in effect at one time. In terms of the process, what we propose is that the property owner would apply to the planning commission to actually join the program. And the planning commission would review it to make sure it meets the site criteria. So that way there could still be a public process and there could be discussion to make sure that criteria is met. Then the project would be reviewed by ASCC um, based on objective standards. So we've talked a lot about those um, municipal code requirements and objective standards. Um, so these kinds of projects would be reviewed compared to those and we'd be writing those later this year. So the objective standards would include things we've talked about before, like floor area, setback, height, exterior materials, landscaping, native or fire safe planting, um, and even things like water usage to make sure that we're considering drought conditions. So that's the update on the changes that we've made and what's included in the partial draft housing element. And so these are kind of an outline for the committee to consider as you're giving feedback um, and for your discussion this afternoon and evening. So staff will be making minor changes to the site's inventory um, to correct the mistake that we discussed. And so are there other small changes um, that are needed? You may wish to consider um, the owners of the vacant lot at Nathorst requesting 20 units per acre, kind of revisit in your mind the end of the last meeting, which happened a little bit quick at the last meeting when you landed on six units per acre. And now that you've seen how it kind of all comes together, just kind of let us know that it's come together the way that you intended. Um, and if not, are there other small changes um, that we need to make? Are there ways to strengthen or improve the draft ADU programs? Do, I have, do we have, we captured everything? Is there anything else that we should add there? Something that's less important that we should take out? Does the opt-in upzoning program satisfy the committee's intent? Um, do you think this will do it to kind of disperse the units and get you know, a handful? We've got 18 units. Um, are there any ways to improve it? And are there other comments for staff to consider as we develop the full public review draft? Um, and I will note that, as always with this process, the, the timing is challenging. Um, so we want to think about um, how can we fine tune what we have now? How can we provide it, you know, make it a little bit stronger, um, meet a little bit more of the community's interests as we continue on with the next step? So what happens now after this, after this committee meeting tonight? Um, we'll go back and finish the additional sections and make any necessary changes. And then we'll be releasing the full public review draft um, at the very end of this month or in early June. And then there'll be a public review period for 30 days. And so the committees can meet, the public can you know, um, really get into the document. And then the upcoming meetings that we have scheduled during that time will be Wednesday, June 15th, there'll be a planning commission meeting to review the full draft and hear how this committee's work has been going. And then this committee will meet on Monday, June 20th to look at the full draft and give any comments on the full draft. Then we bring all of that together. Um, so Wednesday, June 22nd is a town council meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. This is a typo. Wednesday, June 29th, a week later. Okay, the 29th is the town council meeting and we'll be putting out lots of materials about this. So, um, sorry about that. This is the 29th, um, the town council will review it. And then we'll take all of that comment, package it all together, come up with the HCD review draft and we will send that off um, to the state in early July. And then it'll go into them for their review period. And then this committee will transition. We'll have a little break because everyone's tired. And then this committee will have a chance to come back and start to talk about zoning and some of the other things that we need to work on. So 
that is the overall um, presentation. Um, as always, it's a lot. So thank you as you continue to um, bear with us through this process. And so we'd be happy to answer any questions and we look forward to your feedback. All right, terrific. Thank you, Laura. Well done as always. Um, just so people know, at the moment we have 85 people from our town participating on the, uh, on the call. Um, okay, so I guess first we're going to go to questions for Laura about anything that you've uh, just heard about. And Anne, you're up first. Oh, you got to unmute, sorry. <laughs> Gets this every time. Yep. Okay. Um, no, thanks, Laura. This is good. I actually have a lot of questions. Hope that's okay. Um, when you say... Uh, on the, uh, I think it was the Ladera zone, you said that we would make it affiliated housing and upzone it, is that right? I didn't understand that and why, uh, why it's got both designations. Yes, um, it's a multi-part answer. Um, Ladera Church had already requested to join the affiliated housing program and the town council already said yes to having them join. And so this mm -hmm. would be formalizing that previous action that the town council extended. Mm -hmm. Then we expect the affiliated housing program um, to provide more flexibility um, and it would need a planning commission approval. So it would be things that have to be more master planned um, is a good way to think about it. As opposed to the straight zoning will just allow exactly what the zoning says and the objective standards. So then someone like Ladera Church would have the choice. They could go through the affiliated housing route or they could go through the zoning route, um, depending on what kind of project they ended up being interested in doing. I see, great. So the, uh, we give them both designations and then it's at their option to, to follow whichever path is more beneficial to them. That's what we intended. Okay, no, I like that. Okay, good. Um, on the opt-in, I have a bunch of questions there. Why did you limit it to an acre or bigger? It seems like since it's um, six units per acre, we don't need that number. I mean, if somebody had half acre, well, they only get three, but what's wrong with that? Um, and, I'm hearing Anne. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you, Anne. I don't usually when we're on Zoom, so I don't know if something is oh. different. Yeah. Huh. Um, oh, there we go. That was better. Okay. Yeah, that's better. All right. Did you hear my question or should I repeat that one? Yeah, I think it's why did we choose one acre? Yeah. And why um, not for the opt-in? Yeah. Um, okay. So we chose one acre because that has been a common threshold that the community has used for different regulations over the years. And um, it has been an effective way to kind of be a proxy for it's enough room to have sufficient setbacks. Mm. So when you get to the sites that are one acre or more, that's when you start to have the setbacks that most people think of in the community. Um, so that's when you start having the larger 20 foot setbacks and 50 foot front setbacks that really preserve um, neighborhood character, at least has been pat judged that way in the past by policymakers. So it does not have to be one acre. Um, but we do think the staff's recommendation is that the important that the sites are big enough to accommodate sufficient setbacks. Mm -hmm. And the prevailing wisdom right now is um, probably a 30 foot setback for fire separation would be the minimum. Because mm -hmm. um, we could get that to that through objective standards, right, and setbacks. And if somebody can take their half acre lot and make small enough places such that they meet all those, uh, then it would be okay. Yes, it certainly could be possible. It's a policy decision. It's kind of a priority balancing decision. And it's a question of how do you see those kinds of neighborhoods changing, right? So I do the exercise, choose one of those neighborhoods in your head. Do you know what I mean? Choose mm -hmm. Corte Madera, mm -hmm. choose yeah, yeah. a neighborhood in your head and think mm -hmm. what I want that site. Do you know what I mean? To have those. Yeah. And I, from me, from the planning director's point of view, it does raise more questions around fire safety, but it wouldn't um, exclude that possibility. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Thanks. Um, and then 
uh, as you all know, I'm on the planning commission, uh, resident uh, committee. I'm a little concerned about this review by the planning commission. Will, if somebody meets all the objective standards, will they sort of get the um, approval to build or to get zoning at six units per acre? Or is it, uh, is there gonna be a kind of a big fight over each property that gets proposed? <coughs> Excuse me. The way that we intended it, um, is that the planning commission review would just be to say it meets the criteria. Okay. Now the criteria, depending on how it's written, might need a little bit of interpretation. So let me give you an example. You might have a site that has a big area that's big enough to develop and meet all of the objective standards that's relatively flat and then has a little steep drop off. Mm -hmm. And so you might ask yourself, is that less than 30% slope? Is that less than 20% slope? And you can't codify every example. Yeah. So the planning commission would use some judgment in saying, does it meet that criteria? And then once the planning commission says yes, then that person would have the right to build six units per acre. I see, okay, that's clear. So, because I was wondering why um, the HCD would allow us to have unnamed sites because there'd be could be a potential huge fight but oh, it's pretty objective and the planning commission will be obligated to you to use some judgment but yeah um, the planning commission wouldn't be allowed to reduce the density okay the planning commission yeah. would only be able to say it meets the criteria okay and is there a way for it to cap out after we get to 18 you know what if uh People just keep applying and applying and applying um, over the eight years? We believe yes. Um, we've been working on this technically. We think we can write it so that it would sunset. Okay. So After. that we, we would need to come up with the right mechanism. And yeah. there is, like many of these things, there's a little bit of a risk with HCD. Huh. But the way that I've been thinking about this is this is sort of, a, a, it's the buffer. It's kind of like the extra. And so hopefully they'll be agreeable to say, oh yeah, once you've met your extra, once you've met your numbers, you don't have to keep doing this. Yeah. And then what if um, somebody, the first applicant had a good flat lot that was three acres. So then, uh, you know, got permission basically to build 18 units. Uh, the one thing that would be too bad about that is we wouldn't have dispersed the units. They would all be in one place. Is there a way to guard against that or discourage that, I guess? Um, that's, a great, that's a great point. Um, and I think that's something we could consider in terms of how we write, how the program would launch and how we would write the criteria. Um, so I think that's, that's a great question that we haven't got to that level of detail yet. Okay. And then my last question is a whole lot hinges for me and other people on thinking about how the town will look with these additional projects. Uh, it seems like just a whole lot hinges on the objective standards that we can bring to bear on, on all the different projects. Who, what's the process there? Who's gonna draft that and then review it and put in, give input? So um, per the council's direction, when we went back to them, um, they said that we could um, bring additional resources in to kind of do the level of detailed analysis that we need. Um, so we're working with Lisa Weiss Consultants, who's a very experienced firm that writes zoning codes and objective standards. They also do housing element work. So they're very knowledgeable about what we're doing. Um, and so they would be working with our existing team, so the staff and urban planning partners team, and they would be the ones writing code and writing objective standards. And so what we anticipate happening is the basic, all the basic code. So that would be like the basic setbacks, height, floor area, all of that would be done by January of 2023. Okay. Then immediately following, we'd come back with a little bit more detailed objective standards, like really fine tuning um, to think about things like 
it, how do we make upper stories of buildings um, blend into the roof line so that the upper stories aren't as visible? Um, some of the more detailed privacy impacts, um, like really, if we wanna do anything really detailed with massing, like building articulation so that you don't have big solid walls so that you would be required to break up walls those types of things would come a little bit later in early 2023. Okay, and you'll feed things into them that, like the picture that Judith Murphy showed us where there's a big parking area and we would rather have um, plants near Alpine Road or the scenic corridors, they'll, they'll get that input and try to draft things that say, yes, have bushes by the road. Yeah, so we'll take that input that we've received so far, um, we'll feed it into them. They'll do what I would call pretty preliminary um, materials for us. Like they're not gonna take it too far yeah. um, to make sure that we're getting feedback and it's going in the right direction. So this group will review those materials and make sure it's consistent with what you imagined, you know, for the housing element. And it's pretty sausage making. So I think the planning commission will have a really strong role. So this committee will say, yeah, that's what we had in mind. That's consistent with what we talked about. Planning commission will do some sausage making. And then I think the committee of committees, you really heard from Judy that they're really interested in some of that. So I think those committees that review projects will also be really involved in that part of the process. Okay, sounds good. That's all my questions for right now. Thank you. That was great, Anne. Thanks. Glad to have your expertise on our team here. Um, all right. See if you can top that, Al. <laughs> oh, it's not possible. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I really only have one or two questions. I don't have a whole uh, library of them. Um, my question, uh, Laura, relates to 4394 Alpine. Um, the idea of zoning that at 20 units per acre is interesting, but it gets us back into the, there's a lot of concern about overdoing it in that, in that area. And so I guess I have two sort of questions there. One is, uh, if we decided to do that, could we drop off um, perhaps the property behind Roberts um, and not, not include that at all? And, and then I guess the other thing is, could we, is it, is it the kind of thing that we could have a discussion with the uh, landowner at 4394 um, Alpine and, and agree to upzone it to 20 units per acre, but get him to commit to not use the density bonus? I guess I'm, I'm a little worried about that 20 units per acre turning into 36 units uh, and, and really overwhelming that area. Um, so, I, and I think it's great. And from what I've seen of his work at, uh, at the Willows, he's an absolute pro. So having him drive some sort of uh, high density development, I think would probably be as good as we could hope for, but I, I'm still concerned about the, uh, the overall density impact in that area. Um, I think that's a great point and a great question, Al. Um, so let me take it in a couple of pieces. Um, the conversations that I have had with that property owner, and they would have attended, but they weren't able to attend this meeting because of a conflict. The conversations that I had with them are that they are very invested in a, a quality development to happen there if development happens. Um, you know, they've spent a lot of resources and energy into the Willow Commons site next door, and they are very committed to have an, an excellent project next door to the Willow Commons, whatever form that might take. They haven't thought very um, much about specifically what that would be. If they may develop it themselves or they may have a partner to develop it, but either way, I think they would strongly influence any development that would happen there. Um, I think our, the, our staff and town communication with them is very excellent. And I think we definitely could have additional conversations with them and see what they feel comfortable sharing with the committee and with the public. So that's kind of like the big picture for that. Okay. And then in terms of the specifics, I think if the um, committee wants to have the 20 units per acre on that site, I think we could remove the parking lot. Staff 
um, would need to work with the numbers a little bit in the different income categories. But in terms of sheer number of units, you could increase the zoning at one um, and take off the parking lot from the list. Okay, thanks. And we haven't, staff has not been able to have a conversation with the owners of the parking lot. Um, so we were, you know, we've been trying to follow up on some of those um, individual conversations, but we've not had a conversation with them. So we don't know their specific interest at this time. Okay. All right. That's interesting. Great. Thanks a lot, Al. Um, Amy Armsby, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I had two questions, but one of them was very, very close to Al's about the density bonus. And I think I I got enough information that I don't need to re to ask my question. But my my other question was about the Glen Oaks numbers um, and and sort of the allocation uh, to different categories. I'm just I'm curious what what informed how you allocated. Are you just trying to fill the areas of need, or or is there a logic to the way that that is allocated? There's mostly logic, and then some filling the need. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what we imagined was that there would be a 15% affordable housing component on that project. And normally when there's an affordable housing component, you're going to have low income units right. that are part of an affordable housing um, inclusionary zoning. So we imagined that three of those would be low income and then two would be moderate income to meet their affordable housing requirements. So that's kind of based on some recent practice of the town and some other best practices. Got it. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks, Amy. Um, Helen, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, first of all, kudos to staff. You guys are just to really uh, rock this. So well done. Um, I question about ADUs, like obviously, you know, we're pushing the envelope on ADUs and there's been discussion about using HIP housing. We're not using deed restrictions at all, um, but I don't see as much flexibility, you know, like if we're going to allow three units per housing or per parcel or six units on some to get to our numbers, um, ADUs are actually much more flexible when you put them in due to state mandates, let's be honest about it, um, and they're more cost effective because you don't have to provide parking. So I, once again, like we're pushing either very small units with an ADU, very small relative, 1200 square feet, or if you're on, you know, uh, or they get to go in on the whole far for, um, for non-ADU applications. So my question is, why would we not allow ADUs to come in with more flexibility? Um, we certainly could. I think the area that makes the most sense to me based on the Planning Commission's review of ADUs over the last few years would be to allow larger ADUs that might be better accommodate families. So the planning commission talked about this, how long, and maybe four hours on the discussion of just on this topic. I mean, a lot of hours the planning commission spent on this topic. And the planning commission originally recommended some higher numbers to the town council and was split on whether those higher numbers were appropriate or not. And then the town council ended up going with the lower numbers. So there was um, a lot of people at the time that felt the, the larger ADUs would be appropriate. And so I think that that is something that could easily be taken back up to try to accommodate like a very, um, you know, still very efficient, but a more efficient family size unit for, for an ADU. Great, thank you, that's my question. Thanks, Helen. Uh, Sarah Wernikoff, go ahead. So Laura, I know there were a couple uh, typos and I just wanted to clarify how they impact the buffer and to confirm, are you still targeting 20% max as the buffer? Yes, we are targeting 20% max, but because of the way the formulas work and some of the things that we already know about, we might be 
we can we might be a little over 20% in some categories and we're aiming for exactly 20%. Okay, so the net the net number though for the total will be 20 cuz I, I think right now it says 24 but I just want to make sure just to clarify it the net number will be 20. Yeah, I'm not good at math, but I think <laughs> when we're done it'll be about 21 or maybe 22% buffer overall total because each of the individual buffers might have to be a little bit higher to make everything fit together. Okay. Should I explain um, it a different way? I know that it's confusing. No, conceptually, I understand that. I guess I'm just wondering um, what, you know, cause we were at 304 with the buffer and um, I don't know. I just, I guess I would say right now that I just, anything we can do to not go over the buffer is what I'd be interested in seeing. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to, um, well, I guess it's less of a, I, I, I was, you know, attended the committee of committee meetings and I think there were some good general comments about um, this concept about the collective density as, as you come up Alpine Road. And I don't think this committee has really discussed that this, that, too much. We've been really focused, like uh, lot to lot versus looking, you know, Ford plus Ladera plus the Wedge plus Glen Oaks. Um, and so, when you look collectively, it it really does start to add up there. And I guess my question would be then: I know that we wanted to, and you're going to hate me for this, Laura. I know that you really only wanted to focus on ADUs and the opt-in, but you know, if there's the ability to you know, uh, increase ADUs a little bit, would there be the option to then decrease Glen Oaks a little bit? And I don't know if that kind of thing could be on the table at this point, but that's something that's going through my mind as I play around with my little spreadsheet here, and I'm sure you hate me for it. <laughs> um, I, I don't hate you for it at all. I've been thinking about the same thing. Um, so I had a follow up conversation um, with Stanford representatives, and they've been thinking a little bit more about the site and the location of the creek and kind of the amount of setback that they would normally have around a creek of that nature exceeds our town setback for a creek that size to meet their own biological standards. Um, so that site could end up being less units. Um, than what we guessed. I mean, we're in the right ballpark, but it could it could end up being less anyway. Um, I think we're pretty. So I, I mean, I know it's hard because we made the mistake. So I'm sorry about that. But you know, that 10 units comes out. We have about two units we have to move around to meet all of our requirements. And so, if you wanted to reduce Glen Oaks, we would have to really think about what would be the trade off. Um, if you increase ADUs anymore, remember we have to stick with the proportion across the income levels of 30, 30, 30, 10 across the income levels. So like if you add, do you know what I mean? Like one yep. ADU, you add four. So you can't, you know what I mean? You kind of have to add them in sets of four to go across the income levels. Um, so we're increasing our risk with HCD by adding more ADUs. Um, we also could add a few more opt-in units. We have 18 opt-in units. So we could add a few more there. Um, so those would be choices. Both programs have a little bit of risk, but we think both can be justified. I'm a little hesitant about increasing ADUs too much more, but if we're talking about a few um, a few numbers, I think we can certainly try it with HCD. It's not unreasonable in my opinion. Okay, I'll hold off the rest of that for, for the comments section, but I just wanted to, I'm happy to hear that a little finessing there is, is in play. Um, can I know, just ask a question to follow up on that, Sarah? I'm sure. sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but so Laura, I'm just curious, like in your opinion for the um, Glen Oaks potential project, I mean, how many units would you could you shave off of it so that it actually looks like a smaller density project? Because if you take four off, it still looks like you know a, a significant multifamily housing. If you take ten off, does that really change the the impact? Or 
Um, I, I think even taking a few units off of a project of 32 units makes a difference. Uh-huh. Um, that that's my opinion, right? In my, you know, in my experience watching projects that have been reduced okay. <laughs> over the years, it, it can really make a difference. Okay. Um, and it's also going to be about having conversations with Stanford and writing standards that minimize the, the massing um, and encourage them to do housing types that um, are going to are going to fit in as, mm-hmm. as much as possible and, and don't have as much massing. Sure. OK, thanks. Sorry, Sarah. Go ahead. I don't know. The only other comment I was going to make just because um, I sat in, in a, that committee on, of committees, it was not just you know, the, the collective whole of all those, but it was also losing both the wedge and Glen Oaks as equestrian sites. And we haven't really had a lot of commentary about, you know, the equestrian cohort point of view. Um, so I'm just sharing it for what it's worth was that, you know, the la- the only one left would be spring down. Um, and, you know, the rural equestrian culture is part of Portola Valley's history. And so I guess, you know, I, the, another reason why I'm bringing up Glen Oaks is if it's a pipe dream that there would be some way to do some housing, but retain some um, of the equestrian element there. So just, just wanted to add that for those that didn't have the benefit is, of attending the committee on committees. That's it. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Let's see, Amy, you went, uh, Bob Turcott, go ahead. Thanks. I have, I have a number of questions, Laura. Um, thank you for the the great work. This is um, um, a really impressive uh, um, uh, compilation of of work that you've you and uh, staff and consultants have done. Um, I had a couple follow up questions from our last meeting. Um, you had mentioned that Ladera Community Church asked not to be included in the um, sites inventory. And yet I see it, um, I saw it last meeting and this meeting as well um, included in the table that we're gonna submit. And I was wondering, is the sites inventory something different from the table or when you refer to the sites inventory, is that the table that we're seeing in the agenda packet? That is the table. Um, This might be a nuance that's only in my head. So forgive me if that's the case. But my conversation with Ladera Church is that they're, Governing is by the whole um, collective, like all of them have a role in the governing. And there's some people that we've been working with and they're probably on the meeting this afternoon. So they they might speak in the public comment. They didn't wanna get ahead of their community um, and speak on behalf of their community when the community wasn't ready to go forward with something. So they didn't want to say to us, from a proactive point of view, please put us on the list. But they didn't object to the committee putting them on the list. So that was sort of the nuance. Like if it came from the committee, they 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 thought that that would be acceptable to them. Okay. And um, the fact that we're considering re- rezoning is justification enough for it to be on the list, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And I understood... Um, El Mirador dropped off our list because um, there was a complex ownership arrangement and um, some easement issues and Neely property dropped off the list because um, getting the wine tasting facility was kind of a uh, arduous process and the projection was that further development would be even more arduous. Is that, is my recollection correct with those two properties? Yeah, that's a fair summary. Was there a conversation between staff and the property owners or was it just, uh, um, sort of pulled based on that, on, on those observations? Um, Jeremy had some direct conversations, um, direct conversations with the Neelys. And it was um, my professional judgment that the planning process for that would be very complex um, and not likely to result in a project during this housing cycle. So not never, but just not soon, um, based on the level of feedback that we received during the winery um, application. And then for El Mirador, I'm sorry, I don't know the details. I know that Jeremy had conversations with a couple of different people. Um, There's multiple owners, one had passed away. So there's just complexity around that that didn't feel solvable in this eight year period. Okay, thank you. There was uh, there's a host of suggestions from the community about increasing ADU uh, 
production, junior ADU production, and using the affordable housing fund was among those uh, recurring themes. And I was a little bit surprised to not see it included in today's material. I was wondering if you could uh, shed some light on that. Um, I believe that it is, but it may not be uh, brought to the forefront enough. Like maybe our language needs to be improved. So we were talking about potentially using affordable housing funds for incentives um, for ADUs. So we can certainly take that as feedback and um, make that stronger in the next draft. Um, ultimately, the council will need to make some decisions about how to use the ADU funds. I'm sorry, how to use the affordable housing funds. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that has been happening organically as this committee has been working. So we have quite a few ideas now of what we could um, kind of effectively use those funds for. So I think we need to improve the language. It's, it's, um, it was our intent that we continue to explore that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, forgive me if I'm not remembering this correctly. It was a long document, but I believe that it said that um, we've had 11 applications for ADU so far this year. Is that, am I remembering that right? You don't need to look it up if uh, you don't offhand, but- uh, I have it. Right there, okay. Um, we have seven ADU applications um, in 2022 through the end of April. And then we've got maybe this is somewhere in the staff report seven or eight more um that we're in communication with okay um i mean my thinking is if that rate you know this is only half of 2022 if that rate continues for eight years we're essentially at 90 adus um the plan that's in the packet today would um have adus uh satisfy 29 percent of the total um, the Almanac has had a couple of interesting articles on Woodside and Atherton. Woodside is uh, satisfying their um, plan with 50% ADUs and Atherton's using 64%. And so um, I, I completely understand the, the risk that, that you're perceiving, but it seems to me that there's multiple layers of incentives, uh, including financial incentives that we're talking about that are present now that were, weren't present before. and. Um, you know, there's a number of advantages that the community finds appealing about ADUs. I won't reiterate, but I'm just wondering if there's not room to get more uh, in line with, say, Woodside, where 50% of our um, housing is represented by ADUs. So I think this is a really important question, um, and it's natural to compare to other communities that are in similar situations that have relied on ADUs to meet the arena in the past. And a lot of people are asking about this and I've really thought about it a lot. Our team has thought about it a lot. So I think an important thing to think about is the way that it's being reported by the Almanac, though correct, is focusing on a different um, analysis than what HCD is asking us to focus on. So we're talking about it and the um, media coverage has been as a percentage of the arena. And that's not the way HCD views it. HCD views it as what has your past production been and what is your rationale to increase production? So while I think it's good reporting, um, I don't think it reflects the way that ADUs should really be analyzed um, in order to get certification. Yeah, I, I understand and, the point you're making. It'd be nice to see that data for those communities and, and uh, see how consistent they're their plan is with what HCD is asking for. Um, Atherton is also um, has 18% of its uh, total units um, be SB9 units. And um, from our earlier conversations, my recollection is that um, SB9 units are sort of off the table for us. And um, I mean, you can't speak for Atherton, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, whether there might be some potential there to get some SB9 units, especially considering that we're talking about an eight year horizon here. Another great question that I've thought about a lot. I did speak directly to the town planner in Atherton on these topics, um, and they have active SB9 applications. Um, so they are gonna try to make a justification based on those active applications to say that they anticipate you know, more applications going forward. We don't have any track record of any active applications, and I'm not aware of any other way for us to justify those active applications. I have been having some conversations with um, the economic consultant that we were gonna you know, have do some work, which is kind of 
you know, the plans have evolved. And so what we needed them to analyze has kind of been evolving. So I have thought about asking them to do some economic analysis for us to see if we could justify SB9 units. Um, so that's something that we could still be working on right now. Um, it might be really helpful if HCD comes back and says, your justification is not sufficient, and then we would have additional evidence because they're, you know, for a different type of unit. Mm -hmm. But I would be very cautious to put more than just a couple eggs in that basket if the mm -hmm. committee was interested in doing so, because I think it's a really hard rationale for us to make right now. Seems like a uh, strategic approach would be to include it at this stage and then, you know, remove it if HCD objects rather than trying to add it on later. Um, uh, you, you partially answered one of the questions that was asked by um, a resident about communications with other communities. So it sounds like you've been in communication with Atherton. Do you, do you compare notes with like Woodside and uh, other communities as well? Um, we meet um, with the small towns in San Mateo County. Kind of, I would call it periodically. I think we've had four meetings during the housing element process with them. Um, that's through 21 elements. So most recently, a lot has been happening because of the timing on this. So I've, I've talked to um, Atherton directly in the last week. Um, Jeremy has talked to the town manager in Woodside in the last week about this. And um, people are struggling with the same things that we're struggling with in, in the smaller communities in terms of really having a significant change Mm -hmm. um, and allowing multifamily zoning for the first time. So those are the same things that people are grappling with. Um, my perception of this, just as a professional planner, is that they are taking quite a bit of risk in the um, ADU numbers. <clears throat> and in Atherton's case, the SB9 numbers that they're including. And my understanding of the town council's direction was to really go in the direction of a housing element that we thought could reasonably be certified um, and to maintain rapport and working relationship with HCD. So that has been part of my um, strategy and the recommendations that I've given to this committee. Okay. Um, Judith Mur Murphy uh, uh, raised the um, possibility of um, delaying the more intrusive solutions until later. Is there a mechanism to do that? Because I understand that we want to have the zoning in place um, by the end of the year. Um, we have thought about that too, and some places are going to try some kind of approach like that, but I haven't seen anyone write it up yet. So I've heard with meetings of my colleagues that they might try to do something that if, if they don't meet their numbers in one category, then they would increase their upzoning um, in another category or add sites. And that may work, it may be accepted. I don't, you know, I don't know, but for us, the problem would be kind of that the timing and the community expectations and going through multiple rounds of changes and making sure that we've got the zoning in place so that we can preserve um, local control because of those really fine points of the state law related to zoning. So it gets pretty technically, I think, and um, uh, communications wise challenging to explain to people, you know, how that would be implemented. Okay. Um, this is a concern I've expressed before, but I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot with a question, uh, explicit question about this. And that is at the last meeting, we heard that, you know, some committee members are counting on an evacuation plan that's in place and uh, implementation according to uh, best uh, practices for development of WUI. Um, and, uh, and our evacuation capacity is sufficient. Um, the only public disclosure of an evacuation plan that I've been able to find is the one that was included by reference in the draft EIR for the Stanford um, wedge. And um, that, in fact, isn't an evacuation plan. It's a template for a plan that was created seven years ago by Woodside Fire for Portola Valley to complete. So based on that, it looks like we don't have an evacuation plan. Um, we don't know what our evacuation capacity or timing is. Um, as the plan is now, we would increase density in areas that prompted, you know, Zeke Ludner to say, look scary, I wouldn't build there. And so my question is, um, are you concerned that 
what we're creating won't pass legal muster with CEQA law and that we're at risk of a problem there and setting ourselves up for failure in terms of um, you know, not, not satisfying the CEQA requirements. Well, we don't know the outcome of CEQA until we do it, but am I concerned? Not any more than I ever am when we're doing a CEQA analysis. Um, there's always things that you learn. That's the point is to have that disclosure and for the public and decision makers to have that information. Um, I have a lot of confidence in the evacuation study that Fair and Peers is working on right now on behalf of the town um, that Jeremy is leading. And I don't have those dates in front of me, but I believe it'll be in front of the community in July. So um, that's in time if we learn some things from that to um, make adjustments to the next version of the housing element after we get HCD review of the first draft. And then I would say in terms of CEQA analysis of evacuation planning, um, this is an evolving area. And so when we're in an evolving area of CEQA, we use the best information and the best practices that are available. And then we learn from that. And that sometimes the next CEQA analysis it's, is could um, evolve because the best practice, the case law, those things evolve in CEQA all the time. So I, I, feel, I feel confident that we'll be able to um, produce the, a document that has good analysis according to the best practices at the time we do it. Do you, do you know, do you have a sense of when we'll see that? Um, well, the CEQA document timing will be timed to um, be able to approve the housing element and the safety element by our goal date, depending on how things go with HCD. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're hoping that's in January 2023 or maybe even earlier if things go really smoothly. So we're, we'll be timing the CEQA document up with that. It's going to depend on if we get a lot of comments back from HCD or if things change and we have to make some revisions to the CEQA document. Um, but it would be released in time for a, a public comment period um, going into like an approval process for the housing element, safety element. So this would be end of the year kind of time frame sounds like yeah yeah okay. end of the year kind of time frame all right cool thank you um I had some questions about the new approach to opt-in upzoning and um uh, some of the language that was included in the agenda packet was that you know the motivation one, the motivation for this change in part was to mitigate impact on neighbors but i didn't see you know in what's written up how that impact is going to be mitigated i was wondering if you could elaborate on that um, in that language, I was thinking about um, mostly about advanced knowledge and the ability to participate and have those decisions be really thoughtful. So some of the feedback that came back to me directly was that because we were moving quickly to kind of see if people would even be interested in opt-in, we started with, hey, what's your people's general interest? And that turned into seriously being on the site inventory very quickly because of the pace that we were going through. So we heard from people who lived around some of those sites, this might be okay with me, but I don't even know what you're talking about. So I don't know if it's okay with me or not. And so we were trying to create more, an obje more of an objective process with criteria that people could understand and people could participate in um, so that neighbors wouldn't feel sort of blindsided mm. by it. So that was my intent in the language. Okay, thank you. Um, there's some safety exclusions for the opt-in housing. Um, one of them is that it be outside very high fire hazard severity zones as adopted by the town council. And my understanding is at present, there are no um, very high fire hazard severity zones that have been formally adopted. And so this really relies on the town council um, making the designations after Woodside Fire District uh, does its analysis, right? Correct. Um, what happens if, uh, you know, Cal Fire a year ago promised that their maps would be done by the end of 2021 and they're still not done. Um, uh, what happens if Woodside Fire doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't get their maps done until well into uh, 2023 or beyond? I mean, is um, there, would there be a... Would there be a call for the town council to make the designations based on Woodside's 2008 analysis and Merit's 2008 analysis or? 
I think it depends on the timing and how all of this goes. So um, we still remain optimistic based on our routine check-ins with the fire district that they'll have um, at least the first phase of their maps this fall. Um, we've also heard rumors, they're absolutely just rumors that the Cal Fire actually is gonna finally get the maps done. Um, and so if we do not have maps that are appropriate to refer to, we would have to revisit this type of language throughout the housing element and the safety element, um, and then make some decisions and some recommendations and probably planning commission and council level decisions about what to do in the interim until those maps are finished. But the timing is not terrible because this will be with HCD for a few months, this housing element, then it comes back to us, we'll know whether the maps are gonna be done or not, and we'll have to make some decisions in the fall about what to do next. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I am getting close to the end of my questions. Um, I had some questions about the buffer. Right now it reads a 24% a buffer. And um, I think at the last meeting there was conversation about um, using the lower end of the range as recommended by HCD, 15%, which would um, result in a total of 291 units rather than 314. And so I'm wondering about using 15%. Was there an explicit decision made to go with 20? Um, my understanding was at the end of that last long meeting, there, um, there wasn't direction from this committee to change it, like to just keep it at 20% and stay on that course. The reason it popped up a little bit above 20% in some of the categories is because of that moving the numbers around and trying to make everything work. So that mistake popped one of them up and then um, we just have to move things around a little bit between the income categories. Okay. Um, the calculation of the buffer is based on the total number, part of which is um, uh, uh, projections for pipeline projects and ADUs, which seem much less risky than the more speculative development due to zoning changes. And I'm wondering about the argument that, you know, the buffer should really be based on the less certain speculative numbers, not the entire number. If we, if we exclude pipeline and ADUs from the calculation of the buffer, a 20% buffer would give us 275 total units instead of 314. So I wonder what you think about that rationale. I think there's some rationale to be made to not have the buffer of pipeline projects. The only project that we have actually approved is Willow Commons. Um, the Stanford project is a pending project with an active application. So that's not approved yet. So I think that that is sort of a, you know, is an interesting question. I would not recommend taking the buffer off of ADUs. I do not think that would be well received by HCD necessarily, especially if we're already trying to increase our ADU numbers from, you know, the formula is 56 up to, you know, this number, you know, anything that's in these higher numbers that we're talking about, like a 92, that's, that's already a big increase. 92 or 150. Yeah, so I, okay. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that, yeah. but it's, I mean, these are, you know, if the committee wants to make those recommendations and the planning commission and council can consider them. Okay, this is uh, getting maybe close to typos, but I wanted to clarify. Um, at one point, it says the um, housing element covers pine period January 2023 to through June 2023. I thought it uh, went to the end of the year, uh, 2031, I mean. Does it end in June or in at the end of the year, 2031? Um, the eighth year, uh, great question. We'll have to check. We'll check okay. it and fix That's it. That's red page 11. And then it, on page 44, it, it refers to the cycle starting on June 30th of 2022. So that, that was a related question. Um, and then it, it says on page 53, uh, to avoid concentrating too much new development in the area, the site's inventory includes up to seven units for the, Nath this is in the context of the Nathorst area. And yet um, we're talking about uh, rezoning to 20 units per acre. And I'm wondering how you enforce seven units if we were zoned to 20, but I'm, I may be misunderstanding what's going on here. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know that particular language. You could have to, you'd have to point me to the particular I'll, language, but. Maybe I'll follow up with you. Uh, okay. okay. Um, and then, um, 
policy three revised standards and approval process for affordable housing create new parking requirements for affordable housing i'm not sure what that means it's very vague in general what's what's going on there uh most cities have a separate parking requirement for affordable housing um as opposed to market rate housing because um numerically there's a lot of evidence to show that affordable housing projects have a lower parking need than market rate projects. So we would have to see, you know, we'd start with affordable housing, but then we'd have to make accommodation for the fact that we don't have any transit here. So it's really means come up with a good affordable parking standard so we can um, work on that language. Okay, thank you. And finally, you'll be glad to hear last question. Um, it says the town intends to review this housing element annually. I'm wondering how that will be done. Will, there, will there be public participation or is it, you know, staff uh, reviewing it behind the scenes or how will that work? Um, we're required to do an annual progress report to the state on their form. So it will be that process. It will just be um, more detailed um, now that the state is asking for more information. So the town's historic practice has been for that to go to planning commission and to council before it's submitted to the state. Um, some communities just go to council. They don't go to planning commission. So we could certainly keep it with the town's practice of going to planning commission and then council for that annual report. At, at a minimum, though, it sounds like it'll show up before the town council and the public will have a chance to see it in the agenda. Yes, absolutely. At a minimum. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for your thoroughness, Bob. That was great. Um, okay, Sarah Dorohy, you're up next. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, a quick question, and I understand fully, Laura, your reticence around relying too much on ADUs, but it does keep coming up and it does seem to be a popular option um, with our community. So I, my questions, I've got two questions. First of all, um, are other communities like us, Woodside, Los Altos, I don't really call Atherton like us, um, are they building a 50 unit low income facility like the Ford Field proposal that we are gonna put on the table, which I think shows that we are you know, in good faith trying to do something to um, alleviate the housing, very you know, affordable housing issue. So, I mean, I think that HCD will look very favor favorably upon that um, good faith effort that we are putting forward. So basically, will we get more brownie points for doing that? And in that case, can we then perhaps bump up our ADU buffer, knowing that even though our past um, ADU numbers are much lower than that, I mean, you know, times have changed, the town is making it much easier for us to build ADUs. You're proposing an amnesty for people who already have them. I mean, I would think that, that that previous data is outdated and I would hope that HCD would have an open mind. And again, this could be a ridiculous comment, but you know, surely they can see that we are approaching an AD, ADU situation with a very different mindset than what we have done in the past. And we are basically being pushed into building more of them. So I would hope that we might be able to squeeze a few more ADUs in there and thereby perhaps reduce some of the density and massing along Alpine because I really, I share the concerns of other committee members about, you know, our scenic corridor starting to look pretty jam-packed. So those are my two things. Really, HCD, please give us more brand points for the 50 units. Please consider that we are in a new phase of ADU world and that you know whatever we've done in the past is no longer relevant. So those are my two comments, and hopefully there's something in them. Um, I am not. Uh, Atherton had a potential site, and to my knowledge, um, for an affordable housing project, and to my knowledge, they removed that. So I do not think Atherton has a site like we have Ford Field. Um, Woodside is less clear to me. They've identified a couple of sites. They seem smaller. I don't know if they're going to have the feasibility to do a, a affordable housing project the way we're talking about. Um, and I think that we'll get brownie points. I hope so, um, because this is a real thing that we're talking about. And we have reason to think that it's really feasible. It's not just on paper. We've, we've, we've got some professional feedback that they think it's possible. So we certainly will emphasize that. And yeah, I think it does give us a little bit of room. Um, we just, it's just a matter of how much risk ultimately, you know, and like balancing relationship with HCD, ultimately that's a council level decision. 
but the feedback of this committee is really important. So Laura, when you say risk, what are you thinking about there? Um, if you come out very um, aggressively with HCD, it's not necessarily gonna pay off over time, right? The HCD reviews our ADU ordinance, they review our housing element, you know, they have a whole compliance division now. Um, I just heard a, you know, presentation from their compliance division. We have received communication from their compliance division on our ADU ordinance. And um, so they want to be in the position of giving what they call, I just heard, what, heard a webinar on this, what they call technical assistance as opposed to enforcement. And so I think the town should try to stay in that bucket of they're just providing technical assistance as opposed to they are enforcing something against us. So we want to keep relaying our intent um, and keep relationships up with them so that they understand where we're coming from. Now, all that being said, I've been trying to have a um, conversation with our with an ADU, I'm, a, I'm an HCD reviewer, and I haven't heard back from her yet. So I'm going to keep trying. Um, but they're really overworked reviewing all of these housing elements. And so it's kind of like the best analogy is like when you move out of the house, like fill the holes in the walls because then no one will look at everything else. Like we kind of wanted to have a bow on it, you know, if we want to go through quickly. And this is why I say this is a council decision in mm -hmm. terms of do they, do we want to be in a situation where we have to do more back and forth and it could take a lot longer. Um, or do we want to put something forward that we think has the best chance of certification early on? These are very important, you know, conversations and decisions to be made. I view for Ford Field as the bow. That's the bow. It's a huge bow. Yeah. I reckon it's a bow and a big cake. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about cakes in an earlier meeting with a lot of layers. <laughs> yes, that was my original analogy. Yeah, and I think it's much nicer is, than sausage, I think. Yeah, we say that too often. I think that the committee has really done a lot of work to put the layers of the cake together. So yeah. to me, it's just about exactly what are the proportions of the pieces. I mean, I think that's what we need your last feedback on so that we can put this whole draft element together. And then the flavor of the icing, of course. Yes. Okay. That'll be our last meeting. Um, Cake okay. for everyone at our last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can't wait. Sarah Wernikoff, go ahead. Oh, hand down. No, no question. Okay. Amy Armsby. Um, have there been, oh, did you want to say something? Can I, yeah, sorry. I hit the wrong button. You're jumping around my screen. I couldn't find you. I'm sorry. Quick question, um, Laura, and I know we've talked a lot about these percentages in the other towns versus ours, and I appreciate your perspective about um, the risk um, that it's not about the percent. Um, but there was one, one comment I saw in one of the articles that said um, HCD would be comfortable, could, could, would consider uh, projecting future units beyond the historic production. And they said, quote, if they had solid evidence showing a larger number of units would be constructed during the eight year period. I don't know how true that quote is. And I know you can't believe everything you read, but I'm curious if you've had any indication from HCD about this concept of having a concrete um, evidence to suggest that the projection would be higher, would, would give us a little more, I'm not saying we should go to the Atherton or, or Woodside numbers, but give us a little more wiggle room than where we are right now. Um, so one of the things that we've been thinking about is to do a big survey of residents um, and ask people about their interests, their willingness to, to rent to lower income tenants, even though you know they're not going to make money off of it um, necessarily. So there, we have been having conversations about that. Um, so it is a tool that we could use. Woodside did something, but I don't know how comprehensively they surveyed. Um, I don't know the details of that, but they did some level of outreach. So that is something that's still on the table. It would take some time. Um, so we would not have it, we would not have results in time to submit um, at the beginning of July. 
but we could conceivably have results so that we could respond with a second draft with more evidence to support ADUs. So it would just, you know, increase the likelihood of having maybe another round of review, but that might, that might be fine. Okay. Um, so it does sound like you have heard that if, if you have something such as what you're describing with the survey, that that might be considered evidence to give us, to, to have them allow us to go beyond the historical by somewhat. I've not heard that from HCD myself. Okay. But definitely other people are thinking that. So I don't know if they actually heard that from HCD directly or if other people are just trying to do what we're trying to do. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Um, all right. Amy Armsby. So um, I'm just curious. Uh, I, I think I know the answer, but have any communities statewide who, who would be considered at all similar to our community um, had their plans, housing plans, uh, their housing elements approved, accepted, whatever the word is? Um, I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, we I, I could, do. yeah, we could check with 21 elements. That group has read the most housing elements from the other regions out of any other group. I mean, they really read a lot of housing elements and been tracking this. Yeah. So we can ask to see if anybody knows. Um, in Southern California, at first, the numbers were really low for certification. Yes. And now the numbers are going up. I just heard from the HCD representatives in a webinar because now they've addressed the comments and they've been through two or three or even four rounds of HCD review. So now they're getting certified. Because I, I, I would think, you know, when we think about what our strategy should be, um, do we submit our our last best and final, uh, so to speak. Um, do we put together the absolute best we can come up with uh, that we that we you know that we think has a the best chance of succeeding, or do we or do we you know try to play around at the edges a little bit, knowing that we may then be able to in negotiate you know if it gets rejected we may be able to address the concerns with. Um, going back to our original numbers, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's, it's a strategic, it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of strategic thinking and it would be useful, I would think really helpful to look at, particularly on the ADU issue, to look at who's getting approved, who's getting certified and what they're doing, you know, vis -a -vis, uh, ADUs. Um, you know, because it's a it's an issue you see coming up over and over again. It came up in the Santa Monica plan. It came up in a lot of the Southern California plans that were initially rejected. So, yeah, I just think that might be a really helpful. I know you're super <laughs> swamped, but if there's any way to gather that information through 21 mm -hmm. elements, I think it would be really useful for us. Yeah, that's a great idea. All right. Thanks. Amy. Um, any other questions, comments from our committee at this point? Um, all right, I, I do have one question and I just really wanna try and get some clarification, Laura, because I still don't understand how this density bonus works. Um, and I guess my question is, is it, is it something that's available for every project that would come before the town? Um, and then the follow on is, are there ways to zone to prevent it or limit it in any project? Okay, so let me start and then we can have Kara um, tag in as needed. So I think uh, the first really important point is that the Ford Field site is owned by the town. So we would not be in a position that a developer would come in and use density bonus without the town's permission there. Okay. So that would be a collaboration, a kind of a joint project. We would choose a developer and tell them um, what we expected to see. Um, so that's the first thing. So we, I don't want people to be afraid that there could be, you know, 80% increase over 50 units at Ford Field. I don't, I, I don't think there's any possibility of that ever happening. Then in terms of other projects, if there's a private project on private property, density bonus does apply. 
and there's not a way for us to get out of it. It is intentional by the state to encourage affordable housing to get built because some other affordable housing projects result in money in the bank, but not units in the ground. So that's why they keep amending it to make it more and more kind of liberal so that developers can use it more. If developers meet the affordability percentages um, that are in the density bonus law, then they automatically get some density bonus and that's that sliding scale that we talked about before. So if you've got like 15% affordable, you get a little bonus. And then if you've got up to 80% affordable, that's where you get the big bonus. And it's that big sliding scale. Mm -hmm. So we talked about having an affordable housing component on some of these projects. And as we've been thinking about this, um, my recommendation now is to develop some affordable housing fees that people would pay into um, and not have an affordable housing component on these small projects. So let's use the um, like a six units per acre example. If someone came in on the six units per acre and um, proposed 15% affordable, then they would have the right to use density bonus. So that is true. Um, from a financial point of view, um, providing low income units or very low income units is very expensive. So then they need that density bonus to be able to make those units economically viable. So that's the purpose of the law is like to give concessions and to give additional bonus units so that the affordable housing units have a way to the market rate units then can pay for the affordable units. That's kind of the relationship. And so we can't stop that from happening um, on privately owned properties. The result, of course, though, is we would get affordable units that would be deed restricted for the, you know, the full 55 years um, and that would go count for us for RENA if people did that. Okay. Is that does that answer the basis of your question? Yeah. Super helpful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's clear now. Um, okay, so, Laura, I would love to have a five minute break for people since we've been going for a while. Um, would you prefer to do it after we do the public um, comments before uh, the committee discussion or do you want to do it now? For staff, um, it's either way that, that the committee would like to do it. Okay, team, does it, any strong preference in going now? I, I vote do it now so we can be focused on the resident okay. comments when we come back. Okay. So why don't we take a five minute break now? We'll resume at uh, six minutes at 9.50. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Okay. So we're gonna take public comments now um, on the second agenda item. Um, Ellen Bernatza, you're first up. Um, through the chair, what yeah. I would recommend for questions is what we've yeah. done before. I'll try to keep track of questions and answer them all at the end. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. All right, go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, um, I just was surprised today to see the possibility of building 20 units on the vacant lot next to the other high density housing. Um, I was under the impression that the consensus of the most of the town was not to rezone all of Nathworth as high density housing um, and to put 20 units back on the table right next to another high density housing, which is then um, you want to rezone the office park as higher density zoning. Um, what happened to spreading it out across town and also putting that 20 units on the most busy intersection in town as far as evacuation and, and just traffic in general. Um, anyway, I just don't know what happened between the previous meeting and now that we would even think of putting 20 units on one acre up here again. I thought we had worked our way out of that. Thanks. I'm so sorry. Rita Comas, you're next. 
Hi, thank you for taking my comments. Uh, one comment is that at times on the screen, other towns have been asking during Zoom meetings, public Zoom meetings, for the participants to please put their cameras on and leave their cameras on so that people know that they're there. And at times during this meeting, I believe there are 14 people on this particular committee, but there are times that there were only six people showing that um, are named on the committee. So I question on if we had a quorum at those times and with the issues that this town has been having concerning quorums, you know, perhaps we should have people have their cameras on to show that they're actually here. And maybe um, when people are talking, maybe we can have a, um, a call out for the people on the committee again to see if they are here. Um, during the housing element meetings regarding ADUs, there was a meeting, I believe, on a Thursday evening. Uh, many people in my particular group, they talked about failed attempts of building ADUs in this town. Uh, and so those wouldn't be counted as, you know, things that were uh, being built. And other people that had illegal ADUs and wanted them uh, normalized so that they could be counted uh, I guess they're also not in that group. And so I'm not sure when somebody was talking to, uh, what is it, H HCD, uh, if that was part of the discussion that we do have those outstanding issues in our town that are not counted in what's been submitted to the state. Uh, you know, you talk about there's going to be a 30 day time period for uh, people to make comments. And then there were three committee meetings that were um, shown. And of course, that was early on in the process. And here we are a couple of hours into the process. So I don't remember everything that was on that sheet. But I did not see an opportunity for a public meeting. And I know we've tried to do this before with the housing meeting with the public, and uh, which got moved around a little bit. And, um, and also for other things, wildfire also. And so if there can be a public meeting, uh, especially before those 30 days start, you know, that document is reviewed by the community before it goes in. And, uh, you know, with um, Judith, uh, Judith Murphy's report, if that could be, you know, given to every committee member uh, in town, since many committees have not been able to meet because they don't have a quorum, so they can't even discuss it, but that would be a great assessment of what's going on for those different committee members that don't have an opportunity um, to have someone to talk to. But I would like the question of the quorum and to know who is actually here. Thank you. Thank you. John Silver, you're up. Thank you. Gosh, I was just typing a note because I thought I was gonna leave for Berkeley be, be, uh, about a minute from now, but anyway. I just want to say I strongly support the thrust of what Judith Murphy said in her comments uh, earlier when she reported a summary of the um, feelings or the input from the, I'll call it the committee of committees. I'm not sure if that's the proper name, but I'm particularly concerned about the potential of the Ford Field open space. And I think we have to, and I don't, I don't know if there is a better alternative, I'm ashamed to say, but we've got to find one. And other than that, uh, in listening to some of the comments that were made under old communication, many of which should have waited for probably this agenda item, Owen said something about planning for the rest of us, and I couldn't help but think of Seinfeld and Festivus, and at least it brought a smile to my face, a holiday for the rest of us, Festivus. But back to business, um, I, one other person, and I think it's been adequately covered, but why plan for 20% more than we're required? Because, well, we're being required to do that. It's, I think the state could have set this up like, here's your what we hope you'll your minimum requirement but here's what you've got to plan for and that's essentially what they've told us it's a 20 percent buffer and um it's clear to me unless we want to lose control of local planning why we have to try to square this circle but god i hope there's a way we can do it that doesn't mean building on the ford field open space which to me is a travesty once you lose 
public open space, public parks, playing fields, you're, we're never gonna get them back. Thank you. Okay, Mary Hufty, you're up. Hi, thank you for all this great work. Um, I had a, a question first for, for Laura. Um, uh, I, I was wondering in, in when she introduced the uh, topic of the opt-in, uh, if she under somewhat underestimated the negative reviews that came back to her, the resistance that came back to her about opt-in. Um, I think we were all quite confused about the opt-in to begin with, and I, I had thought it was an interesting idea, and maybe you know we should all go to the uh, the, the groups. Uh, but I think uh, from I wanted to say from the point of view of Portola Valley Neighbors United, we have done quite a bit of work on the opt-in option, and uh, I think we feel that this is basically giving up control completely, uh, local control, and basically saying that zoning doesn't matter to us, um, that we hadn't thought out our zoning plan and that we can't really get a good uh, plan together. I think our, our community is more creative than that and more positive than that. And uh, I think the, the opt-in truly uh, pit, pits uh, neighbor against neighbor um, and is uh, a big mistake for us to go down that, that hole. If, if uh, we do go down it, well, I actually don't think we should go down it at all, and, but I appreciated Anne's effort to uh, cap it in some way. Um, I also wanted to uh, mention um, that the one, as other people had, that the one acre limit uh, seemed uh, slightly um, arbitrary because a half acre would be more reasonable and might make la the Ladera situation a little easier for them. Um, and, and also clearly, um, we need to bargain. I mean, this. I think they expect us to bargain. I don't think they expect us to come in. Oh, I may be wrong, but uh, it would be um, positively. Um, it would, it, it, it's it, it's an unusual strategy, as Amy pointed out, to say, "Oh, here's here. We want to give you all this, and then expect to get uh, get less." So, Mary, I'm I'm sorry to say you're out of time. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, David Cardinal, you're up, please. Uh, sure. Um, one thing that I've, I think I've heard is a claim that we don't have an evacuation plan. And I want to set the record straight there. We absolutely do. It would be a slap in the face of Woodside Fire to say we don't. They have a detailed plan. It's on the public website. It shows where everyone should go. It shows um, where everything should be. And their private version, I mean, they know where to send officers, as does the Department of Emergency Services. So if you don't like the plan or you're not convinced that the plan will evacuate everyone, hopefully the study will address that in a couple of weeks. But saying we don't have a plan, I think, is, is just wrong and kind of offensive, frankly, to the professionals who are our fire department and are in charge of it. So thanks, that's all I wanna say. Okay, thank you. Tim Clark, up next. Yes, I'm Tim Clark, I'm with Ladera Community Church. I wanted to go back to address Bob Turcott's question to Laura earlier. Uh, Laura got it exactly right, the interpretation of our uh, governance. Uh, we're happy to be put on the list, but we're not going to ask to be put on the list. The reason is that we're in a stage of exploring uh, affordable housing for that site. So, uh, Laura, I think you have a future in diplomacy if this doesn't work out in planning for you. Uh, finally, I also want to say thank you, Laura, for the correction uh, on the number of units you might put on our site. Uh, when I saw 20, I blanched because I couldn't possibly sell that to my congregation. Uh, so thank you for correcting me. That's it. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, okay, Rebecca Lynn, go ahead. Hi there. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This has been so helpful today and you all have done a ton of work. I just would really like to um, 
really double click on both Amy and Mary Hefty's comments. I mean, I, I, like many of you, have been in hundreds of negotiations. Unless this works, unlike any other negotiation I've ever been a part of in my entire life, it is a very bad idea to go in and say, here, here are the keys to the kingdom. We'll give you more than what you wanted. Um, nobody ever says, thank you. We'll, you know, we'll be nicer next time. You know, what usually happens is next time that just sets a higher bar for you, right? And so I think it's always good to have a plan that's like high, medium, and low, but you never go in with your like a high plan thinking that somebody is going to thank you for that, right? You're just sort of cutting your own throat. And so I would hope we wouldn't do that. We're really smart people on this committee, and I, I hope that wouldn't happen. And then, you know, the other thing too is that I also want to double click on this rural and equestrian community. I mean, it feels like we are just throwing that out. And, and that's a little heartbreaking to me, having been a major reason to live here and not Atherton or Menlo Park. And, you know, the whole thing too on the upzoning, I couldn't agree with Mary Moore that this just pits neighbor against neighbor. Basically, developers will just come in here and like, you know, throw in their, throw their name in the hat for like yeah. any property, right? And, and then if we were even going to do it, like why on earth would you put 20 houses on any one acre? Like why wouldn't you disperse it throughout the community a bit more? Maybe you put four at the most, right? And let it go. But it just seems like a bad idea, like on every front. And so that that's just my sort of two cents having, having come into this more recently. Thank you, Rebecca. Karen Askey, you're up. Hi, thanks. I think this has been a fabulous discussion. Laura's presentation was awesome. And I thank the committee members for all their incredibly thoughtful questions and insight. Um, I am still concerned about overdevelopment and this thing with bonus density. And Jocelyn brought this up. Good news that Ford Field could be controlled, but I'm wondering if there needs to be an added column onto the sheet that shows the potential total units with potential bonus density because we already have that buffer and then we might have more because of the bonus density. So I think we need to look at that a little bit more carefully. Um, I also think like many others that we need to take more risk like our neighboring towns and increase the number of ADUs. And just sort of in simple math, I think Laura mentioned we did 11 units in 2021 it looks like we're on pace for 20 or more in 2022. So if we average those two years together, we're at 15 and that would be 120 over eight years. And I think there's a strong argument for that because we're gonna do a lot more promotion. Um, on the opt-in for the six unit, you know, one acre lots, I'm just curious as to how many lots actually currently uh, qualify and then I know we don't have a track record for SB9 units. It would be pretty hard given it just went into effect this year, but I think we could take a risk there and put a couple and, um, and work with that. Uh, and I, also I think that we need to be thinking about the Hawthorne's development and the parking and the traffic that would be there. I know the committee of committees mentioned looking at this holistically and so I do um, have concerns about putting more units at Nathhurst. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, Karen without a last name. Hi, um, I feel- Who is this, please? Hmm? Who is this? Karen Baltra. Um, I feel a little guilty because I was the one who initially um, um, suggested the opt-in um, and my initial idea of the opt-in was more, hey, let's ask people out there, are there anybody with larger land that would be appropriate and that we could really explore that as a whole community. But um, it's kind of morphed into something that I'm a little nervous about, that if we have a program um, that people can look at over the years and it gets into more, you know, neighborhood conflicts and um, puts the planning commission um, in just, it, you know, in a challenging situation and it could be open-ended perhaps HCD says in four years, no, you can't end that because you got your three units. 
or your three, uh, three acres taken care of. And it just, I, at this point and the way it's changed, I'm not, I don't support the opt-in at the moment. Um, unless Laura can really explain to me, I guess this is a question for Laura. Can you explain how we end that opt-in and what's the, you know, what confidence do we have? We, we could end it. Thank you. Jocelyn, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I had a cat that meow, so I keep trying to keep her uh, out of the conversation, but <laughs> I always forget. So, um, Bill Russell, go ahead. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. The plan that is going to be presented to the state is simply a first draft plan. It's not reasonable nor necessary nor helpful to make our last best offer our first offer. In that regard, the actual number of required units is 253, not 314. As I read the law, the state has no authority to mandate any particular buffer. In other words, if the state finds the proposed 253 units to be acceptable on its own merits. There's no authority to refuse approval because there is no buffer in the draft plan. But even if the town citizens thought it prudent to have a buffer, it should only apply to those units that are at risk of not being approved. For example, of the 253 units, 52 are already in the pipeline. No buffer is needed for those. The ADU development is proposed at 92. We know historically that there was 56 units in the last cycle. Based on the town interest demonstrated in 2022, plus the administrative push for ADUs, it seems quite safe to say that there will be at least 50 units in the next cycle. So if you add the 52 and the 50, that gives you 110 units that can be excluded from a buffer calculation. If you take the 253 and you subtract the 102, that leaves you with 151. Doing a 24% buffer analysis would add an additional 36 units. So you end up with 253 plus 36 or 289 units. This is significant because it gives you the opportunity to subtract from that 289 units, 18 units represented by the upzone plan. In other words, the upzone plan by definition and as expressed by other residents tonight is fraught with difficulty, fraught with implementation problems. It has legal problems relating to inverse condemnation, spot zoning and the like. It doesn't have to be part of this initial draft plan. Second point, I'd ask the committee to take a look at page 58. That's red page 58, black page 78. There's language in there that I don't understand, and maybe I've missed something, but it, what it says is implementing programs allow new multifamily housing through rezoning and other programs. And it says, create a new zoning district that allows for multifamily housing with up to 20 units per acre to provide for development of housing at lower income levels. To my recollection, this was never something that was supported by the citizens of this town. In fact, the committee's own survey demonstrated this is the last thing that the members of this town wanted. And I don't believe that this committee itself has ever approved of this kind of development plan. So it's a mystery to me as to why that's even being included in this draft plan, if in fact it is. I believe that if right. it intended to be- I'd love to ask you just to, to kind of conclude right now. We were sure, out of time. sure. I just don't think if it was somebody's idea to put it in the plan, I think I can wait until another day. I don't think it has to be done now. That's it. Thanks very much. Um, okay, Bob Adams, you're up. Uh, yes, uh, this goes back to my earlier comment. Uh, I, I'm trying to understand why the town center land 
uh, by the substation, by the sheriff substation, is not part of this conversation. It was earlier in the conversation. It seems to have dropped out of the conversation. It's town on land. You can specify what you want. Uh, if you put in eight units there, say two buildings and a couple of parking places, you're, you've got flexibility that you can apply to things that don't happen in other places. Uh, also, if you want transportation, we could either have a fund that I'd be glad to help fund for Uber or uh, that we buy a, a vehicle that people can use as for transportation. I just think dropping that location out of all conversation is not productive from the standpoint that if something else doesn't work that we can use that. So I haven't heard a word about it. It just seemed to fall off the, fall off the table. That's it. Thanks, Bob. I'm sure Laura will address that. Um, okay, Ron Eastman, you're up. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for taking my comment. I, uh, <clears throat> I was going to say something very similar to what, um, what Bob Adams just said. I don't understand why the town and property town center is not included in the site inventory. First, I would prefer not to have any high density housing for many reasons. Um, but in terms of the negative impact on, on I want to, I might just want to talk about the elephant in the room about homeowner equity. Uh, this would certainly minimize those types of impact. For instance, the Nathorst E property being built a high density, being proposed as a high density building site right next to a high density building site, um, if developed would be across the narrow street from a home on a one acre parcel, which sold for $6 million in 2018 and with Zillow values at 8 million. So I wanna know, are you pretending that the value of that home and the others around it will be perceived by the market to be the same after high density housing is located 30 feet away. The preamble to this uh, draft document is a litany of the historical, social and economic injustices which plagued this country, but nothing about the inequity and injustice of ripping up the social compact we trusted would hold when we made the biggest investment of our lives in this town with our hard earned money. So um, I, you know, <clears throat> I prefer to see more ADUs. Um, I've heard some of you reject the idea of junior ADUs being a significant part of our arena fulfillment because and I'm paraphrasing here, that our children and family members would end up living in them. But I want you to know that many of us have children who have not been as lucky in life as we have. And certainly these persons are not suggesting that our children and relatives are not worthy of living in these units. Junior ADUs would put no additional structural fuel in, in our town. Um, I think we should make it very, very easy to legalize um, the illegal junior ADUs that are in existence and encourage the develop the building of new ones and, and make it the, of course, as others have said, make the, uh, the, the permitting of ADUs easier all overall. And that could be an argument to ACD. We've make, we're making it easier to build an ADU. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna take over for Jocelyn for a second. Um, the next person is Robin M. Robin M, you can unmute on your side. Sorry, Robin Murray here. Um, so thanks for all the hard work you guys are doing. Um, I know it's a hard job. Very quick, um, would like to just reiterate, take more risk in the negotiation. Um, second, I think on the upzoning, um, it really does um, have the potential to impact the um, uh, the social fabric of neighbor and neighbor. So, in that case, um, I just think we've got to find a way to get a neighbor opt out um, or some real input as opposed to what's been suggested. And then third, I would try and get some feedback or we'll find a way to solicit feedback from the community. This is obviously in the, um, a whole set of issues which you know people get quite emotional about. And I just think getting some systematic feedback about the relative priorities would be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Um, Jean. Go ahead. Go ahead, Gene. All right, this, this is a question for anybody on the call. 
and that is, uh, has anyone on the town council, the housing committee, town staff, reached out to the uh, CAL group, California Alliance of Local Elected, so as to be better informed and understand the options we might have as a town to make some intelligent decisions? Can anybody answer that for me? So we're gonna um, just take all the questions now and then Laura's gonna address it at the end. Is, do you have any other uh, questions oh, or comments? That's it. Okay, Posted you, it four thanks. times and uh, never got a response. So pretty disappointed. Thank you. Thank you. In okay. what organization was that? Could you repeat? Hale, California Alliance of Local Electeds. I was on a Zoom call with this group. The uh, town attorney for Palo Alto was on, the mayor of Woodside, Mayor of Los Altos, Mayor of Lafayette, they're all enjoining to see what the options are to challenge the state. And we're sitting here with sitting on our hands. So I would like an answer, please. Gene, we, ad we addressed that issue at the last meeting when you raised it. We will what, be happy to follow what, up with you later. And, and what was your answer? There was a non-answer at the last meeting. Did anybody contact anybody at Kale? Yes or no? Do you no? want to take it offline? Uh, yes, I'm happy to correspond again with, with Eugene. OK, we're going to take that one offline and guys can follow enough. up. OK, we've got uh, a CKT bear. Who's this, please? Hi, it's Cornelia Tilney again. Hi, oh, Josh. Cornelia. Hi, bear. Um, it, it always comes up that way. I don't know why. Um, Laura, I want to thank you for all your diligent work. It's an incredible report, and I really appreciate all the effort and everybody else's. Um, just to weigh in on a few things, I also am very worried. Uh, the opt-in originally sounded somewhat reasonable, but I am extremely worried now that it sounds like it would get totally out of control and that many more units potentially could be added than planned for in the town. So I really think if there's any way to take that off the table, we should. Um, I also agreed with what Laura said about the fact that if we had to put it in there, that it shouldn't be below one acre. Um, you know, uh, I also wanted to ask Laura if there are any other locations that aren't listed that, um, you know, that haven't been included who have volunteered to upzone. Potentially, uh, I had heard a rumor about the area, that whole, um, business area where Parkside is, is located. Um, and then Laura, I know I brought this up with you before, so I'm sorry to beat a dead horse here, but I am still um, like many other people here, very interested in trying to add more ADUs and feeling like I really wish we could explore um, using the ADUs that aren't currently permitted. And I know you had said in the last meeting that you were gonna look into whether if they weren't currently permitted and people applied to have them permitted after um, January 1, if they could be included. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, we actually had a unit in our house that was um, not legal, that would be a JDA, JADU unit. We took it out, but we could add it very easily back in. Um, I know there's been a proposal to add town funds. There's a $4.6 million fund. And could we provide financial incentives for getting people to legalize them? Um, you know, what is low income and what would be a rent rate that would have to be if that were the case? And I think another major factor for people is as a town, if we could provide information to people about what happens to their property taxes and the value of how the county assesses their property. Um, you know, if they were to put in a JDU or legalize their unit, and what would they actually have to do to make sure that it's legalized? Because none of that information is easily, readily available or easy to decipher. Um, lastly, like many people have said, like Rebecca and Bill Russell and a number of other people, I really feel strongly we should not include a buffer amount in our numbers that, um, you know, the more we provide, the more we will, th they will think that, um, you know, we have room to give and Cornelia, we should I'm be so acting like we have stretched and stretched as much as possible. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd just like to add one more thing. 
I would Your like to actually up, have Cornelius. the answer to Jean's question online, you know, on back on. Yeah, but the CALE, I'd like to have not that be offline. I'd like to have us all get an answer to that. Okay. Um, Laura Davidson, you're up next. Hi, um, thanks to the committee for hearing my comment. Um, we've discussed a lot of topics that are um, very uh, important to our town, like trails and our rural character and, and our equestrian community. Um, one thing that I feel like we haven't discussed is um, the safety of kids as they commute to and from school. And I just, um, I hope that we can discuss um, decisions around housing that will impact um, safe commutes um, to Ormondale, Corte Madera and the Priory. Um, I know that some of the trails near there um, are uh, really important for commuting. Um, so I just hope that you can keep that in mind as we make these big decisions. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Dana, you're up. Here I am. Okay. Um, I want to thank Judy Murphy again for just a great presentation and for the committee of committees. That was a wonderful meeting and they were incredibly helpful. Um, I am a general plan person, so I'm less concerned about what the final outcomes are going to be as I am about the, the general plan. And so this draft, I want, I really want the people's hands all over this draft. And if we can't do it in town hall, I am going to put some meetings out there where we can actually do some work sessions for people to, to look <laughs> this over and to learn from their dogs. Um, and so most of you know that I was on ASCC Architecture Commission for close to 20 years, conservation for 13 years before that. And, you know, we would look at the square footage, uh, the allowable square footage for a property. And if it went over, there was an 85% rule. And so, and the purpose of the 85% rule was so that we looked kind of rural so that there would be a house in a little house next to it, rather than a big mass. So I can't tell you how many projects we approved, these secondary houses, the secondary units that did not have kitchens in them, and they all have deed restrictions on them. And I think if the town did a search of just the deed restrictions, these, all these properties were passed through the Planning Commission, passed to the ASCC, and there are buildings galore. And so I've been actually doing some research. I've been talking to people and said, would you be willing to put a kitchen in? And they all come back and say yes. So if the staff needs my help in trying to dig these properties up, I would be very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Okay, next person up, phone number ending in uh, 7562. Good evening, my name is Caroline, Caroline Bertongen. Okay. Um, I will not repeat what, what a resident and actually a few committee members said. I mean, so many important uh, concerns that we have raised already and so many questions that still need to be answered. So. Um, I was wondering why is ACD not coming and why don't we have a Zoom meeting so we can ask the question directly um, with so many uh, uncertainties and so many speculations. Who are um, you asking about? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I did not understand your question. I, who are you asking who, who didn't come to a meeting? I'm asking why we don't have ACD representative come and have a meeting with the residents in Portola Valley because every meeting that I go to and where the housing element is being presented to get new information that is not shared with uh, the, the whole community. There's so many speculation and there's so many uncertainties. Um, we would like to know if these numbers are really correct. And yes, I... Uh, I, I agree with our uh, residents. There shouldn't not be a buffer if there's no buffer needed. 
Um, as, as you remember, I gave you the list of or the inventory of cycle five, the renal number cycle five for the whole Bay Area. And when you look at that, so many uh, units are empty or cannot be used. And we need an explanation for that. We have stopped, like Laura said, we need an annual checklist. And I have not seen a checklist since 2017, but I know that we stopped counting the ADUs in 2018 because we met Marina numbers of 64. And then I heard today a comment that the way that Atherton calculated its, its, its numbers was done on a percentage of the RENA numbers, and that was not correct. And that um, it actually is that we had to, um, and now I have to find my the exact words, is that, that Thank you. We have, yeah, I cannot find my Go words. ahead, this, your last thought, go ahead. Well, we need to find what it is based, and, and I, I believe that the, our planner said is that ACD wants to know a rationale why for the increased numbers, and I don't think the town has heard that rationale why we went from 64 to 254. Um, we we okay. need answers. Uh, yeah, please, I mean, it's, uh, it's give us an answer on eight hours. Thank you. And I mean, also, it's, a, it's a mandate the, handed down by the state. That's what it is. So. Um, I think Laura will be able to touch on some of your questions at the end of this. Um, just hold on a little bit, okay? Uh, Laura, when you had the um, state folks come and drive around with you and look at the sites and understand the topography and all that, was, were those representatives from HCD? Yes, those were representatives from HCD, including one of the people that reviews housing elements in San Mateo County. Yeah, so Laura's working closely with them. They've come and visited. They don't visit many towns, um, which was, that was a real honor. Um, we were one of two communities that actually got an HCD visit. One of two communities, yeah. So Laura, kudos to you again for that fine job. Um, Leslie, Kreese, go ahead. Leslie, go ahead. Hi, hi, how? Um, I guess I have three points. One, I'd like the town to be um, much more aggressive or more aggressive in the way it's approaching these negotiations. I don't know anyone who leads in a negotiation with their last best final offer and comes out ahead. Um, I wouldn't offer the buffer up front and I would be reserved about how I approached this. Negotiation is a hard thing. We have a lot of people in this town who are good at it. Um, maybe as we go into these negotiations, we should broaden the reach of who's working on this project as well. I'm, I'm, sh I'm not, I'm sure there are people in town who are good at this. Um, second, um, I would like an answer to Jean's question about Calais, and I would like it publicly, um, not in a side Cara conversation. Comment on that, okay? I, it was a conversation okay. they were having offline to begin with, which is why I, I suggested that. But we can certainly have Cara address it in this meeting. Okay, I, yeah. I would like five seconds question? back to, if I need it. Um, but in relationship to that as well, I would like to know um, what our town is doing and talking to other towns about this. There's a lot of, yes, we're talking to them and waving going on, um, but I'm not seeing any concrete evidence of that. Finally, um, I, I just want to say thank you to Ju Judy Murphy for a, a really wonderful, you know, complete, concise uh, presentation. She covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. So thank you for that. And I'd like to put in a plug for the horses in town. They add to our ambience and they make us a better place. Um, so uh, those points are um, be more aggressive in the communications. Let's get a public answer to Jean's uh, question. Um, thank you to Judy and everyone go pet a horse. Your day will improve. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. All right, next up, um, 851-787. Go ahead, yeah. 851. Th thank you, sorry, it's Maida Jones. I wanted to make a quick, um, well, just a quick comment about negotiations. I'm, like many in town, I've been in a lot of negotiations. Of course, we shouldn't lead with our best offer. 
And someone said something about getting brownie points from the HCD. I don't think that's the right way to go in. They have a responsibility to us as well as we having responsibility to them. And both sides will be looking for an outcome acceptable to both sides, given that there is a law, a framework where we're working within. I completely agree we should get someone who's experienced in negotiation because how you do it is very important. The whole interaction is very important. And we have very legitimate points to make in defense of our town, of our atmosphere, of our traditions. And I think there will be ways to accommodate a lot of our niceties within the requirements of this law. But not if we go in with our best offer first and looking for brownie points from the HCD. Other communities won't be doing that either. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I just, I'd love to make a suggestion. Um, it'd be great if people could just sort of now at this point, just add any additional comments and not repeat things that have already been said just to sort of save some time. Um, we appreciate all the, all the feedback though. Uh, Tammy Cole, you're up. Tammy Cole. It says Tammy Cole, but I was asked to unmute. This yeah, is Tammy. we lost Tammy, I think. Okay. Um, well, you so asked us not. You asked us yeah, not. Hopefully, Tammy um, can kind of call back in. We'd love to hear what she wants to say. Lonnie, you're up. Go ahead. Thanks. You asked us not to repeat ourselves, but I've been on every single one of these calls, and I think the reason people are repeating things is because we don't feel really like the feedback's being heard. So I would like to repeat a few and echo a few comments. I'd also like a public comment on the kale question. Um, I also would like to know why we've taken town center off the table. I also want to echo this idea of I don't understand why we're trying to get brownie points with the HCD and make them our friends. I understand diplomacy, but that's very different than, um, than a friendship. Um, and I also would like to echo the comments about negotiations. I don't know why we wouldn't go in with a lower, a lower ball strategy instead of our best strategy. That just makes absolutely no sense to me. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lonnie. Peter Drager, go ahead. Hi, Peter. Yes. Uh, um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Okay, so I, I wanted, I just wanted to say, and I don't think this is, is has really been uh, gone over and it, it bears um, some uh, response, I think, that in the last meeting, I heard a consensus uh, for six units per acre at Nathorst. And uh, at the very wee hours, all of a sudden uh, we got this, uh, well, if it became necessary to include one parcel at Nathorst, at 20 units per acre, which one would it be? Well, um, that uh, was very interesting and uh, it ended up being, um, I guess, uh, so interesting that uh, the town has now communicated with the owner of the parcel uh, to maybe solicit or suggest that he might develop in that, in that fashion. Um, I, I'm very confused by this. Um, uh, not least for the reason that the numbers seem to be modeled now in the count. And uh, we, we need to get away from uh, this kind of uh, suggestion creep. It, it seems like all of a sudden the minority opinion on, on what should happen in Athors is driving the day um, because it just found its way back in uh, and through the back door. And uh, so I want you to, to, to consider that. Uh, I also think it's the same kind of morph that's happening with uh, opt-in. Um, opt-in is, uh, is, is very divisive. Uh, there will be no controlling what happens with opt-in. Um, you, you'll find that uh, the state will be telling you what, what uh, can happen on these opt-in uh, uh, parcels and the town will end up with something that truly that it doesn't want. Um, at the last meeting, we heard that Ford Field uh, could support the numbers that are needed for low-income housing. Uh, that sounded wonderful because it took the pressure off the Nathorst, which was being uh, zeroed in for every, uh, it seemed like every need of, uh, of, of every type of housing uh, massed there. Um, I'd like to know 
Peter, uh, I'd appreciate your um, just sort of summarizing here, please. Thanks. The Housing Committee truly supports six, eight, six units per acre at Now Forest. You're kind of coming in and out, and your time is up. Are you there, Peter? Yes, did you hear me? I want to know if you truly no. support six six units per acre at Nathorst. You want to know if the committee supports that? Yes. Okay, thank you for your comments. Okay, next up, David Cardinal. Hi, there's, there's been a lot of um, questioning about the negotiating skills of our town staff and town government. Um, I'd refer people to their careers and their history and their skills. To be honest, they're pretty darn good at it. And a lot of them have started more companies than I have, which is several. Um, so I, I trust them. Um, I trust you know, Jeff and Craig and Kara and Laura to do what's best for us. I don't think we can backseat guess them more than a certain amount. Obviously they need to, you know, pay attention to what we want, but I think they're, they're pretty darn good at it and they're much more plugged in than we are. And uh, claiming that we can backseat drive and, you know, pretend we can lowball an offer or not. I, I just don't see how that's helpful. So I'm, I'm all in with supporting them in um, what they need to do to try and get the best for our town. Thanks. Thank you, David. Tammy Cole. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Hi. Hi. All right. Thank you very much for coming back to me. Um, anyways, I'm too. Uh, I am too very concerned about the increasing zoning uh, to 20 units per acre in the. Alpine uh, Thorst area. And when we already have one large development going in with 13 units called the Willow Commons, um, I just don't see any reason then to then agree to another 20 units there. Um, the caller before was talking about being concerned with the kids. I know we all see it. The kids in Corn and Madera walk to Roberts and Alpine Hills right after school. It would just really increase immensely. Um, the danger um, of that and having so much built on that Alpine Nathorst um, triangle there. I, that was one thing I want to say. And also I know I don't want to reiterate, but I ride horses, uh, so do my girls and the equestrian community is very dangerous already with the traffic and the cars. So I just encourage to please spread these units out throughout the community, primarily closer to the exits of the town and not so deep in here where we all ride and try to get to the trails. And then my last point is, it seems to me that um, in trying to keep control and appease the state and not lose control of our own town, that the op approach really might get- Tammy, something's happened to your audio. We're having a little trouble hearing you. I lose control. Why don't we uh, move on, you guys? Um, can we go to Rebecca Lim? Rebecca, go ahead. All right, you couldn't hear me. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's just one very last comment for me tonight. And again, thank you all. This has been well thought out. There's been a ton of work. Um, I just want to reiterate what a caller had said earlier, just around these safe um, zones to school. I think a huge part of the charm of our community is that our children can safely walk to school. I live on Georgia Lane. You know, dozens of cars park on here and walk their kids to school. And that will abruptly end if there are 20 or plus new units at the end of Georgia Lane, right? Which I know is on the upzoning list. And so um, I just wanted to know from that, you know, if one, if the um, safe routes to school is part of what is being considered, because it wasn't on the upzoning list in terms of what you should consider. I didn't see anything about safe routes to school for children at all. And then two, I think, we think I recall initially that there was a requirement for two egresses 
from any of these sites. And I'd like to understand if that is retained or not, because I don't recall seeing that in the most recent version. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. All right, looks like last up, Bob Schultz, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, I guess it's, it's fitting my, on the last because I, I, I'm just kind of would summarize and, and um, my comment reflects uh, others regarding the too much density at the Mad Horse Triangle. Um, you know, now, now I'm hearing that there's 20 units per acre uh, development could potentially be done um, at, uh, at, at the uh, Nat Horse uh, C site. Uh, and if the uh, density uh, bonus, uh, uh, density bonus is invoked, that could be up to 36. That, that parcel is right between um, the already uh, approved 13 unit high density project uh, at Willow Commons. And it's also on the other side of that is, is potentially nine to 20, 30 or 36 uh, or maybe more um, units at the Nat Horse site uh, E. Um, and you know our last uh, meeting and in the packet, uh, the packet says that there is a total of 21 units planned for the Nat Horse area. This could bring you know, far more. Um, this kind of density at Nat Horses would be a, a, really a serious impact to the traffic, infrastructure, and safety of the, of the neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Gory, uh, let's see, Gary Morgan Taylor, you, you're last, I think. Go ahead. Hi, Gary. Sorry, I'm, I'm muting here. So oh, no uh, briefly, I think what you're hearing is consensus among the residents of this community that a voluntary decentralized solution based on ADUs and JADUs is the optimal approach for meeting RENA needs. There are formulas to be considered, but <clears throat> that is what the, this community wants. The RENA program is an eight year program with annual review, reviews by our staff. <clears throat> Uh, it was alluded to, but I want to call it out directly, that a phased approach that includes multiple phases and stages ought to be part of our plan to HC, HCD. An initial submission, a phase two, two to three years in, a phase three, four to six years in, et cetera. So start with the community, what the community clearly wants at the outset, then calculate the annual applications, permits, and present the data to HC, HCD as we go forward. And we will be doing this annually reviewing progress. Delay those changes that are undesirable, controversial, or irreversible and unneeded, such as the buffer, until it's clear that they're needed. This includes major high density housing projects, impact on Alpine Road scenic corridor, and neighborhood upzoning leading to conflict from neighbor to neighbor. Finally, there's no, I have heard no discussion about lessening the, the fairly uh, onerous restrictions on the development of ADUs. There's mention of ADU conformance with other building codes in Portola Valley, and <clears throat> but arbitrarily uh, forcing that same conformance has to be compared against the desirability or the undesirability of the other impacts on our community, high density housing, neighbor to neighbor conflict, loss of scenic corridor, loss of trails, loss of equestrian, rural and open space environment at Portola Valley. So I really commend to you, this, this committee really needs to think outside the box if we're going to find a, a solution that works for our community. Thank you all for your hard work. It's a hard job. We appreciate you. Thank you. Two minutes on the button. Thank you, Gary. My pleasure. Um, okay, Rob, Jack. Are you there? Yeah, thank you. I'd like to mention the opt-in voluntary upzoning as being problematic for this town. Uh, I know these outlines are just being floated today, but the greater than 30% slope, the one acre requirement and the very high fire risk are arbitrary criteria. And to have the planning commission have only the power to rubber stamp whether the property meets those criteria doesn't help us. I think at the very least, there should be an outside expert review of the suitability of any property. The property on Ramoso 
slopes down 80 to 100 feet from Ramoso to the creek, the seasonal creek in the bottom. And we expected a report from the Woodside Fire Department on the suitability of that parcel, and I haven't seen it. We need a geologic report. We need a health department report from San Mateo County on the on-site wastewater treatment system for 16 units on a single residential parcel. Uh, I feel that there's no limit has been set up. There's no end in sight to voluntary upzoning and any individual out of avarice can damage neighborly relations. And this whole concept is going to tear this community apart worse than it already has been. And I ask this committee to allow the time in the future to explore the details of this. And hopefully, as others have said, get rid of the upzoning opt-in arrangement. It's totally Thank impractical. Thank you. All right, Rob, really appreciate your comments. Thanks. Um, OK, at this point, we have 66 people from the town who are still on. Um, Laura, I guess you've got a lot of summarizing here. And then Cara, we're going to come to you on the kale thing. Yeah, um, I'm going to do my best. So I want to start with this big picture issue of negotiation and is this a negotiation? Um, so I personally would not define this as a negotiation. Um, if I've used that terminology, I apologize for that. If I've led the um, community down that path to think of it that way. HCD is a regulator. Um, they are implementing the state law, not unlike if you um, propose an addition onto your house and you come to my staff and say, can it be a thousand square feet? And my staff says, no, you're over floor area. You can only have 500 square feet. That's not a negotiation. Um, sometimes there's interpretation. And so the conversations we're having with HCD are about interpretation of the law. It's not a true negotiation. It's not a business deal. They um, don't care very much about this. They're reviewing 230 housing elements um, in a you know, short time span. So they're not invested. Um, they'll just send us a form letter that has a million things that we have to address. And so that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, and so it's not like we sit down at a table. They won't come here. They barely return my emails. Um, we really rely on our 21 Elements Group, which is a coalition of all the cities and towns and the county in San Mateo County to communicate with them because they will engage through 21 Elements, but they engage only very lightly with individual cities and towns. So we're trying to maintain that relationship so that when we have to make interpretations, we can present them with information so that hopefully we get favorable interpretations. So that's what I would say first, um, kind of in the big picture to put some context around this. It's kind of like trying to, you know, negotiate out of a speeding ticket or something, right? Like maybe, but probably not. Um, interpretation is really the key. So Cara, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on that kind of big picture issue first? Um, yeah, I, Laura, I think that's a great way of, of framing it. Um, there are a, a few other um, things that I guess I'd add that um, HCD monitors public meetings. And so it, we have to frame our quote unquote negotiating strategy in public. And so to think that HCD doesn't know that it's you know going to be an initial offer or a last and best final offer yeah, um, really is 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 not accurate. Um, they they have 
access to all of this information. People, um, you know, monitor it on Twitter. And we've seen with the Woodside case example that, you know, within 48 hours of the Woodside um, town council making a decision, HCD sent them um, an enforcement letter. Um, the other thing that HCD is, is looking at this particular cycle is, um, of, of course, affirmatively furthering fair housing. And any, um, any town that is comprised primarily of single family zoning is going to be scrutinized very carefully. And so that's one of the issues that we as professional staff are trying to navigate here. And that's the basis of many of our recommendations um, that we do think that HCD is, is going to require some modest level of some form of multi-family zoning. And it is not realistic to think that HCD will allow us to satisfy our <clears throat> Um, RENA allocation with um, a large portion of ADUs uh, or ju junior ADUs like they did last cycle, primarily because of this refocus and re-emphasis on um, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Thanks, Cara. Okay, I'm gonna try to go through and answer some questions that I think will benefit the committee and the general public. Um, so I'm going to try to move through those quickly. There was a question about quorum and who is here. Um, we've had two committee members that have had their cameras on and off, Bill Kelly and Helen Walter. They're both here. They've just been turning them on and off. This committee in this town does not have a policy about keeping cameras on. Um, we have been watching the quorum. I have been to make sure we always have a quorum of members and we're operating a legal meeting. Um, there was a kind of a question or a statement about whether I personally underestimated the resistance to the opt-in program. I did not underestimate the resistance. I think the resistance is substantial, but I think that that's for the committee, planning commission and council um, to decide. Um, there was a question about um, density bonus and sort of what counts and this, this is a really challenging topic. It's very technical. So I'll refer people. There's a really good handout that was attached to the last staff report and we'll post that online also. There's a law firm that, that puts out a handout. So we'll repost that so that people that are interested can read it. It's kind of the best summary in simple language um, to refresh everybody's mind about that. There was a, an idea, I think if I understood the statement correctly about whether density bonus units, we could assume there was gonna be density bonus and count them towards our count. And the answer to that is no, we are not allowed to assume there'll be density bonus and then count it like as a column in our site inventory. That is guidance that we have from HCD. Um, in terms of how the opt-in program would end, um, and someone asked for an explanation of it. We were thinking of it having some sort of sunset that would have a trigger. Now the exact mechanism we haven't figured out. So that's an absolutely fair point. But we have talked about with our internal working group that we think it would be possible to have a sunset. We would just need to figure out how that would actually work. Um, then let's see. There was um, some confusion about on red page 58, and um, there's a policy that talks about allowing multifamily development and creating a zoning district. Um, that's been part of the discussion for many meetings um, in this group. So maybe new to members of the public, but this committee had been talking about that um, for several months. Um, when we originally started this conversation, it's always been part of the discussion. There's several people asked about the substation at town center and why that was dropped off the list. Um, it can be added back in if the committee would like to see it added back in. Um, staff's perspective, it's not a particularly viable site in terms of having development happen in the next eight years. That's why we dropped it off. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, it would produce, I believe, six um, potential units um, construction of those units would be very expensive. We think it'd be very hard to find an affordable housing partner that would be willing to partner with us for such a small project. 
Therefore, the cost of building that, those units would likely rest purely with the town. And it would be not very good cost benefit analysis um, to spend almost all of the town's affordable housing money on approximately six units. Um, there's also an easement for the property owners behind that property that would have to be renegotiated. And so we think that it's not likely for those to be developed within the eight year time horizon. Um, in terms of the question about the amnesty program and ADUs and whether those um, units would count or not, um, I told you my past interpretation, we think that they probably would not count, but we did um, put that as one of the questions that I asked the HED representative to talk to us about. So we're hoping to get more answers about that. I just don't know what the timeline is gonna be. There was um, a statement that somehow we had stopped counting ADUs when we got to our arena allocation for this cycle. That's not accurate. We keep counting ADUs. Um, they're in our records. We have all of that information. Um, there was a question or suggestion that staff had solicited the property owner of the vacant parcel on Nathorst or somehow tried to convince them to develop at 20 units per acre. That's not accurate. Um, uh, that property owner reached out to me, asked to have a meeting. We did that on Friday. And then he sent me another email today um, after having thought about it, clarifying that they would be interested in the 20 units per acre. Um, just asked for the committee to consider that. Hey, Laura. Yeah. Um, on that property that you're talking about, I just um, was going back over the summary that went out after our last meeting in a table talking, showing the uh, density that we discussed as a committee at every property. And for that 4394 Nathorst, we have here density units per acre, six or 20. So we hadn't made a final decision on that in the last meeting. And this went out the day after our last meeting um, with the town update. And it was also raised at the May 9th uh, community meeting. So I just wanna remind everybody that that's, that's kind of where we left things. That we didn't, didn't solidify that one. Great, thank you. Um, there was a question about safe routes to school and whether that had been considered. And the answer is no, that has not been considered up till now. I think that's a really interesting and good point. Um, in terms of the requirements, I understood this to be the opt-in sites. Um, the way it's drafted right now, it would still require two points of ingress and egress um, as we defined in the study that we've been sharing with you um, over time. And that's all of the questions um, that I had that I think I can give you an answer to. And then um, why don't we touch on the kale question? Maybe turn that to Cara. Sure. So we had talked about um, a lawsuit that had been filed in Southern California at the last meeting, um, I believe, and, and I think I also briefed the, the town council on this. Um, a group of cities filed a lawsuit against HCD in connection with um, uh, overcounting um, the RENA um, and also based on, on the grounds that, um, that some of the cities, um, well, there were, there were several technical um, issues related to um, the RENA assessment in Southern California. And that um, case was um, heard by a trial judge um, and the trial judge actually dismissed um, the case based on the fact that um, there is no standing to sue HCD on these types of RENA allocations because the court recognized that if one or two cities allocations are found to be um, incorrect, HCD would have to go back and recalculate the entire state's allocation and that that was just not feasible. And so um, based on a, a past um, case, 
um, which served as, a, as another precedent for this proposition, the court found that this is the RENA allocation itself is not something that the courts can decide. It's something that um, needs to be adjudicated through HCD, through the formal um, appeal process through HCD. And so the kale loss, the, um, kale had made a pitch to some of the Northern California cities to file a similar type of lawsuit. Um, and I, I can't recall whether that pitch was made before or after um, the Southern California case had been dismissed. But um, now that the Southern California case has been dismissed, um, I'm not aware of any city attorneys who are recommending that um, the Northern California cities um, file that litigation. Cara, if you don't mind me adding to that. The, um, the minute order that dismissed the Orange County Council of Governments so that you're talking about was filed last November. So I think it's pretty safe to say that it was before the recent kale outreaches. Um, and just for anyone who's interested, the minute order from last November uh, filed in Southern California is very detailed. And my best reading of it confirmed by, by Cara and others is that the cavalry is not coming on this. Um, it's not to say that no judge anywhere in California would ever say that that there was that the, the, the process open to challenge, but this minute order was really thorough in basically saying that the legislature had made its intention very clear and had created a robust public process. And so, you know, could somebody somewhere file a suit that would succeed? Maybe. Can we plan or count on that in the next six months? No. It's it's you know, I, with all due respect, Kale is is pushing something that that we have no reason to think will succeed. And I'll be the politician here because neither Laura nor, nor Cara should have to be that. Okay, thanks. Cara and Jeff for that uh, explanation. That's super helpful. Um, Laura, thank you for the summary on all these points. That was also terrific. Um, all right. So we're done with the public comment piece. We have 64 people still on from town. Um, and now we're going to go to a discussion on, um, wrote down what Laura has on the slide. So we're going to discuss, um, the ADU program and whether there's ways to strengthen that uh, recommendation. We're going to talk about whether the opt-in program satisfies the intent. Are there ways to improve it? Are there any other changes that people in the committee want to suggest, talk about? Uh, any other comments for the draft? Um, I think there's some issues raised uh, in the public comment and then some of the committee questioning that we should probably spend a little time talking about, um, including density along Alpine Road and the Nathorst. Uh, um, units per acre on those three properties. I think we should go back and make sure we're kind of, well, make a decision on the one and then revisit the other two that we had decided to do six per acre. Um, does anybody else have any other like major topics they want to spend time on? Laura, does that sound right to you? Yes. Okay, terrific. I need to vacate my water, so I'm going to turn off my screen and switch spaces. Um, but why don't, um, Laura, do you want to sort of start the discussion and I'll come back on in just a minute? Yeah, Helen has her hand up too. It's just okay. kind of hard to see with her background. Yeah, no, I can't. Oh, yeah, it's on, <laughs> it blends in with your uh, window shades. I see that. Okay. Right, um, so thank you. Um, I feel like we should discuss the ADU flexibility with more flexibility with ADU situation, but I couldn't quite hear what you were saying about ADU. So I just wanted to make sure Are that there ways to strengthen the draft ADU program. So we'll touch on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I knew you, we were dealing with ADUs, but thank yeah. you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Laura, I'm going to let you take the lead here for a little bit. I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Following the trend that Jocelyn has usually used in the past, um, I think it would be appropriate if committee members want to start on any of those big picture topics, um, if people agree with that approach. That's what she's typically done in the past. 
Everybody agrees? Okay, great. Would someone like to um, start on those big picture topics? Someone has to start. <laughs> okay, Bill Kelly, thank you. Hi, um, I just had a couple, couple, three points. First, I think the draft plan that's been put forward is a, a very fair reflection of where we left it in the last discussion. So I don't have any substantive uh, comments on that um, to the extent the question is, is that where we came out? I think it is. So I think it's a great starting point. Uh, number two, I think uh, we've heard from a lot of people about our negotiating strategy and all of this. And I think Laura's point on this is exactly right, which is we should expect HCD to be as doctrinaire and inflexible and unreasonable as the town itself tends to be. And therefore, uh, this isn't a conventional negotiation. This is a dealing with a regulator, which means I think those who have characterize this as we're leading with our best offer is, are just misstating the case. We're actually making what I think is a mildly aggressive but reasonable proposal. Uh, and I think the way I think about this stuff is there is a cohort of small, rich, white towns. Um, we all know who, which those are in our part of the world. Uh, we are kind of entering into a minefield here. I would prefer them to be walking ahead of us. And I think some of them probably will. Uh, and I would let them let them walk. I think if, if that happens and they take the brunt of the regulatory burden, they're likely to wind up worse than they could have been if they had been reasonable going in. So I'm in favor of being reasonable going in. And I think the approach we're taking, not as a negotiation strategy, but as a way to deal with the regulator, is sensible. And then lastly, I, I must say, I do have reservations which have been reinforced by the discussion tonight about our opt-in program uh, for two reasons. One, I think the point that's been made this evening about setting neighbor against neighbor, since everyone seems to believe that they have the right to control what their neighbors do with their property, this is only gonna lead to more difficulty over time. Um, and then number two, I think just from a town planning standpoint, it adds a level of randomness to all of this that uh, to me is, is not attractive. It means that um, development decisions in the town will get made on uh, a basis based on individual landowners uh, kind of predilections at any given point in time. So I'm not crazy about that. I think having a small version of that that's controlled with the numbers, if that's what it takes to get to what we need to, to do to you know, meet, meet our requirement, I could live with that, but if there was a creative way to live without it, I would be supportive of that as well. That's where I am, thanks. Okay, on Jocelyn's behalf, I'll call on Ann Copsdale next. Okay, great. Yeah, for me, um, the negotiation, yeah, I've spent a lot of my professional life negotiating. This does seem completely different than when you negotiate with a company. As people have pointed out that, I mean, the state has the cards, uh, they can just say no. Um, and as Cara pointed out, this is all in public. There's no such thing as telling people like, this is our low offer, we're not going any higher. <laughs> it's all in public. So um, I think with regulators, there's some advantage to kissing up, um, not giving, you know, not making a super high offer higher than we need to, but I think uh, the path we're on is very sensible. On the Nat Horse thing, I'm attracted by the home, the property owner reaching out to Laura and sort of being open to the 20 units per acre. So I'd like to entertain that. I would just to keep that density down, take away say the parking lot one. And then on the opt-in, this one's tough. Uh, we did hear a lot of uh, people speak about they're against the opt-in. I still would like to keep it on the table. I have many friends that would be interested in the uh, housing that gets built like a townhouse that they could downsize to. So that's interesting. And I really don't think um, uh, four or six units per acre is a bad thing to live next door to. I would be totally happy and fine if one of my neighbors 
was uh, opting into upzone. There's a house near me that's, you know, 10,000 square feet. I mean, I mean, that would accommodate multiple houses inside. People would say, well, it doesn't have many cars. There's another house near me that's got six renters, unrelated. You know, nobody complains about that. I, I think it's, I, from where I'm sitting, it's not that bad. So um, I do like the idea of limiting it uh, with the sunset clause and just 18. It kind of gives the town a chance to try it out. So uh, I would like that. That's all. Amy Armsby. Thanks. Uh, so first, I just want to say, um, that my comment about whether we should be strategic in our in formulating our plan was not really it sort of was interpreted by a lot of people and then turned into this whole idea of of um, not putting a buffer in place, which was the farthest thing from what I was suggesting. What I was actually getting at was the the these kinds of discretionary or um, or kind of judgment call questions uh, that are on the margins. They don't. They won't make a huge dent either direction. But things like, um, you know, do we stick to a twenty percent buffer, or could we possibly be a little below the twenty cent, uh, twenty percent buffer, if that's where it penciled out uh, for for the projects that we all reached consensus on. So really, I, I just don't want there to be any question that I was suggesting uh, no buffer or that I was, I was suggesting you know, that, that, that we don't in fact uh, rely on our town staff. I mean, town staff and our consultants have extensive experience dealing with HCD. We do not, or at least I do not. And uh, you know, the, the, the town is, is paying folks to make these decisions based on their experience and expertise. So I, I would absolutely defer, and I appreciate so much what you said, Laura, this is a regulator. Um, so I, you know, I just don't want there to be a suggestion that I'm uh, finding fault with the idea of putting together a solid, good faith, strong offer, because I'm not, I, I absolutely am in favor of that. Um, I do think there are some difficult aspects um, and uh, to this to this draft plan, and one of them is clearly the opt-in program. Um, it's not the largest number of units um, on in our uh, toolkit, but it is significant. Um, I, I I would be cautiously in favor of keeping. Uh, an opt-in that was very kind of buttoned down uh, that that added some additional limitations, uh, a sunset, um, a, a cap of some sort. Um, and, you know, I do think if there is a way, you know, I, I if there's a way to um, have a process for um, input, from neighbors that would allow for um, sort of more, I guess, more input or more, more ability to kind of, you know, have a, a, a discussion about individual projects. I think that the, the problem we are in is that there was this list that was out there um, of, of actual specific addresses. And I understand why that was the case. Those were folks who were expressing interest in opting in uh, voluntarily, but, but you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard for people because they've seen those addresses. They don't know what the, um, whether there was any further analysis of whether those particular addresses even meet the criteria that we're talking about um, in terms of putting forward a program. So I, I understand the, the hesit hesitancy and the concern over the opt-in program, but I, it is a component of our numbers. And so we need to figure out some other um, alternative if we're not going to do the opt-in program. I, I agree that the Nathorst, um, you know, the, the owner of the, of the parcel on Nathorst who's interested in potentially a 20, um, you know, 20 dwelling unit dense per acre density 
uh, is intriguing. Um, I do think we need to be sensitive though to this idea that we were gonna try to avoid overdeveloping uh, that horse. So if there is a way to do, uh, I think Anne suggested to do one, but not the other, or not one of the others, um, or not the parking lot. Um, you know, I think I think that might be one way to to kind of get to that um, that balance. But um, that's that's really all I all I had. Um, Laura, do you want to continue on? I mean. No, you should. I was just <laughs> filling in for you. <laughs> Thank you for uh, <laughs> for your help. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. So, um, Andrew, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I agree with a lot that was uh, just said by Bill and, and Amy. Um, I also think that um, I was a little troubled by having all of our 20 unit uh, possibilities or 20 unit per acre possibilities on the board of Ladera that struck me a little odd, uh, particularly as the race and equity committee uh, representative here. So I would be in favor of having at least one of those somewhere in the general vicinity of um, Alpine and Portola or anywhere else really, just not why, do we, why are we sticking them all up against Ladera? Um, other than that it seemed like the easiest thing to do at our last meeting. Um, in terms of opt-in, I think it should be, if we have to make our numbers by using it, yes. Otherwise, I don't think we want to be enthusiastic or uh, generous about doing it because it does, it's, it's taking the power away from the city to plan, really. It's just saying, people, go fight it out amongst yourselves. And um, people are going to lobby their neighbors, they're going to fight with their neighbors, they're going to sue their neighbors. I don't think that's where we want to go, but if we have to do some opt-in to get to our numbers, so be it. Um, and I do think the parking lot, Klein Roberts might be traded off for the 20 units somewhere else. Um, let me think if I had any other thoughts about all of this. Oh, negotiations. Um, I've been an attorney for over 30 years and I negotiate with government agencies all the time in the real estate and zoning field. They don't have any problem at all saying no. And they're, they're, they don't lose anything if they say no. Um, and so, and if they say yes, in fact, Somebody else might take it as a, as a uh, clue as to how to minimize uh, the production of housing in their town. So they're not in, um, and you know, if we get to this point where we say our town is too insular, too small to really come up with a plan, we won't have a plan and, and we'll have state control. And that may be what happens. I've been telling people that. So I think in going up against them though, if you wanna think of it that way, um, the way you do it is you put them to sleep. You don't come out aggressive. You want them to say, oh, this is an easy one to approve. It's not really pushing the envelope. Um, and then they'll turn their fire on, on, on the people that are pushing the envelope. If you look like you're cooperating, at least you might put them to sleep. And I think that's actually a better negotiating point in this situation. That's what, that, those are my thoughts. Okay. Um, Helen, go ahead. Um, so I just, um, it was a great quote that I heard about nostalgia can be disempowering. So, you know, like as we look forward and want to decide how our community, what it wants to be, um, you know, and I actually on my street, you know, I was on Georgia Lane this last week and got accosted by a woman and was attacked basically for supporting opt the opt-in program. Um, verbally. So, um, so I am concerned. I fully support it. Um, but I am very concerned about what it would do to our community. Um, because she said, you know, we can't have lower income people here. And actually, you guys, 166,000, the new AMI numbers came out for a family of four. Anyone under 166,000 a year with a family of four in San Mateo County is now considered low income. Okay, I work for the state, I'm considered low income. Um, so I would qualify. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, so it needs to be said, like, 
And she then, the person, the, you know, then went on to say, well, that, you know, we can't have low income next to school. And she, I was, I had my kid with me, you know, like, and it was, it, it was so strange to me. And I know there have been public comments tonight about that, but please don't be afraid of people like me, right? You know, like this is, I, we are here and we are part of your community. So to have, um, although this week for my job, I spoke to two people, one person who works for Canopy, who works to protect urban forest. She's moved to Atlanta. Another person who, uh, my son's camp director, he's moved to Oregon. You know, like people are moving away. So please don't be afraid of the people who run your summer camps and protect your trees. So, um, so I absolutely support really the opt-in program. I'm really disturbed to hear that that happened and I'm sorry. Yeah, it was awkward um, to say the least. It was upsetting. Completely so um, so I absolutely support the opt-in program. I would hope, um, you know, I would hope that the community would, would recognize that this is a way to further fair housing and to get it through, the, you know, to, to um, and, and to support, um, and just, you know, to, they want ADUs and this is a way to do it. Um, so I absolutely also want um, uh, eight more ADU flexibility. It's, you know, if you're trying to build an ADU, it's to build a garage, which is required with, um, if we were to do an opt-in program or required, you know, required parking and covered parking, it's, it's like a hundred or a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars more to build. So I would hope that there would be more flexibility in the ADU regulations than, curr than currently for family to make it more family, um, to make it more family friendly. Um, I agree with what Andrew said about um, at the, um, to all of our multifamily housing is concentrated down by Ladera and it's, you know, um, it, it definitely does, it's not spread through this town and that concerns me. So I would like to see something at Nathorst as well. And- Helen, you'd support the, would you support the 20 units per acre on the, the Nathorst property closest to Roberts? I, I personally think, you know, I personally um, support as much flexibility with zoning as possible. So if they wanted to go to 20 units, I would support that. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a private property rights. And, you know, obviously we have, we, we are a bedroom community that's been designed to be rural, those invisible restrictions. Um, but I think we could create more of a town feel mm -hmm. with, you know, more of a village feeling. So I do support 20 units at the, at the next to Roberts. Yes. What do you think about taking off the uh, parking lot behind Roberts? Um, it's hard for me to get, you know, I don't know each property owner and I don't know how likely they are to develop. So um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I support both, but I'm not sure it makes sense to do both. So I can't speak to that right now. Anything else from you or you're good? That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right, Mr. Turcott, go ahead. Thank you. Um, the uh um i think the idea you know that we're uh um going to implement um at least 50 affordable housing units on town owned properties as, as sarah pointed out really speaks to how serious this community is taking um the the mandate to pr produce affordable housing um in terms of the adus i think you know if we're backing um with millions of dollars the production of adus um and if we provide as evidence, you know, 100 prepaid pre-applications for uh, ADU or junior ADU permits, I think that would be pretty persuasive evidence that um, we would meet a more aggressive goal than just 92. Um, I, I wanted to comment on a couple comments from residents. Um, I think uh, someone was indicating that we're required to um, uh, use a 20% buffer. I don't think that's right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, but my understanding is there's a recommended range with 15% being at the lower end of that. 
um, jump in if that's not right. Um, in terms of accounting, accounting for um, uh, uh, bonus density, I don't think the suggestion was to use this against our, our arena mandate. Rather, it was to add a column to the table so we had a sense of what the potential impact might be if all that um, bonus density option gets exercised. Um, I have looked uh, high and low for an evacuation plan. The only thing I've been able to identify is what was incorporated by reference in the draft EIR. And there's links provided to that, to the Woodside Fire Protection District uh, website. If anyone reviews that, um, they'll see that it is indeed a template. It calls for completion. It calls for annual review and approval of the entire document, including appendices. It was never completed, uh, let alone uh, annual reviewed annually with approval. Um, the metadata indicates that it was produced in 2015. Um, I don't think uh, Fire Marshal Buller would be offended at me calling this a template because he himself confirms that it was a template that he produced in 2018 with the intention for it to be completed. If someone's aware of a completed uh, evacu evacuation plan, I, I invite them to send it to me. I'd love to see it. Um, so, um, Bob, what are you thinking about the zoning on the Nathorst property close so if you don't mind jocelyn i'd like to finish my list because i've got some specific um suggestions for the draft and uh i can i can um uh, answer your question later if that's all right sure. um uh on pages 35 and 36 it talks about the condition of the existing housing stock and it sort of uh, addresses it in a generic way for generic town and my concern is that it's really missing one of the um very important unique features of um, Portola Valley, and that is, as Bill Kelly pointed out, um, our antiquated housing stock represents a very severe fire hazard. Um, it's very vulnerable to ignition. It's very hard, uh, very difficult to um, harden. And um, it also poses a significant hazard to the people and homes around it. And so my suggestion is at a minimum, um, highlight this problem so we acknowledge it. And ideally actually have a maybe a policy or a program that would facilitate replacing structures that can't for practical reasons be adequately hardened um, i happen to live in one and there's a lot of them um, on page 58 for the opt-in uh zoning portion it talks about um you know safety um measures that would be uh, included and i already mentioned that there are no very high fire hazards very zones designated presently and so my suggestion would be if there's not a designation made by the end of this year that um, the housing element recommends that the 2008 analysis by Moritz and the fire district be um, adopted. Um, it talks about uh, accessibility in terms of two, two uh, ways for ingress and egress. Um, we've seen that that's not adequate. Uh, Cal Fire uh, requires 20 foot uh, road widths to allow simultaneous ingress of emergency vehicles and egress of civilian vehicles. And there are parts of Portola Valley that are much narrower than that, 14 and a half feet, um, that don't fall within this, um, the areas that are, are captured by the lack of um, two, two uh, methods of ingress and egress. So I would suggest if there's a reason not to include 20 foot road widths as a um, criteria. And then finally, last item uh, for safety for opting in one of the parcels that was um volunteered earlier had actually lost um uh fire insurance uh twice um and is also in an area that woodside fired um identified as being very high fire hazard severity um in 2008 and so a suggestion would be that if someone wants to opt in to densify they demonstrate that they've been able to maintain fire insurance on the open market. Um, I think that might be a useful objective way to and uh, using contemporary analysis to um, identify unsafe uh, areas. Um, the housing element doesn't that I saw um, the draft doesn't address um, other um, implementation of uh, state laws and and policies such as the uh, AD ordinance and SB nine ordinance and those are implemented in the areas that Zeke Lugner describes as look, look scary, I wouldn't build there. And so I'm wondering, my, my suggestion would be that maybe as we go forward, we start to address those other uh, broader issues. Um, a couple more points. Um, 
Policy number one on page 58, create multi-family development standards in the new zoning district to allow for greater intensity, including floor area, and it goes on to list some other parameters. I would like to suggest, unless there's another, unless there's a reason not to, to add the language consistent with best safety practices for wildland urban interface areas. Um, because if that's neglected, um, what's being called for here can certainly violate best practices. Similarly, on page 58, policy six, continue to refine fire resistant building standards and land, land use policies to ensure they utilize most up to date science in preparation for wildfire resiliency. I would suggest adding and best practices to, as defined by fire safety authorities. That's all I had, Jocelyn. I'm sorry you had a question for me. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so, in terms of like the policies programs around ADUs and opt in that were presented in the packet, you're supportive of, of what's proposed? Um, yeah, like I said earlier, I was a little concerned that the um, use of um, affordable housing funds to support or incentivize conversion uh, to junior ADUs and production of ADUs didn't seem to be very, uh, didn't seem to appear in the in the draft materials, but um, Laura clarified that it was actually intended to be and it was maybe mm -hmm. too subtle for me to um, to recognize, I'm I'm in support of uh, leaning heavily on um, ADUs, especially junior ADUs. Those are the only that's the only solution that won't add structural fuel. It will distribute um, the burden uh, fairly equitably throughout the town, um, and um, it would have the most modest impact on you know on the character of the town. So I'm mm -hmm. supportive of that, and I think we should be more aggressive uh, for what we're asking. And then what about the opt-in program? Um, Are you open to taking that off the table? And uh, I, so I, I am I'm not enthusiastic about it because um, of the impact it would have on neighbors. Um, um, people, you know, people purchase their property um, with a certain premise about uh, what they were buying, and um, to have that densification happen next door, I think would be problematic, mm -hmm. as many people mm -hmm. have indicated. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not enthusiastic about the opt-in. And then what about the Roberts parking lot and the 20 unit zoning at the Nathorst next to Roberts? So here, um, I, again, you know, as I mentioned last meeting, I, I, I don't feel like I'm informed adequately to um, to have an opinion about where uh, density should go. Should it go uh, closest to 280 as possible? Um, that seems intuitively like the thing to do. However, um, a third of the population in Portola Valley lives in Ladera and would have to evacuate. Is it better to put it on Portola Road? Um, that may be. These are questions that could be answered quantitatively. And I raised them months ago, and I, I still don't have good, uh, good, um, a good understanding of what the impact on evacuation would be. Well, so I'm going to I'm going to pass on that question. Town, right? What's that? People wanted to disperse throughout town, so you know, not have it all concentrated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, Thanks. sorry to dodge that question, but yeah, no, it's appreciate you that. So, um, Laura's looking for feedback on the policies programs that were laid out for ADUs and opt-in. Um, and I missed part of the first part of the discussion. So you may well have been addressing that when I wasn't here, but just to, as a reminder, you know, the way that it's set up, are you, are you happy with that? Are there any edits you'd make on that? Um, all right, who wants to go next? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks. So, uh, you know, regarding the opt-in program, it was a response to public outcry, I'll say. People didn't want to be upsell involuntarily, so we made it voluntary. We didn't want all to happen in one neighborhood, so we tried to we tried to get it to apply to as broad a swath of town as we could. Um, yeah, it's it takes some planning out of our hands and puts it in the in the hands of homeowners, but so does so do ADUs. I mean, the appeal of ADUs partially is they get distributed around town depending on who wants one. Um, that's the same thing with the opt-in. Um, I, you know, I understand that people don't want their neighbors zoning, but you know, I, I also think that, um, again, it's it, it addressed a need. I, I still think it, it it does. I don't think it'll be a huge impact on town overall. Um, I, I think I'd probably still want it in. Um, I would support the twenty units per acre between Roberts and the. I mean, just I. I that feels like to me sort of a place where it's it's going to be between another multifamily development and Roberts, where it's it's 
as little impact as possible. Um, I, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to, to to make short shrift of the neighbors' concerns, but I also think that if you know if you put it out, putting it on the other the um, the office park right now puts it right on um, on Nathorst, which I think is a bigger impact to, to some neighbors. So I, you know, we moved a lot of potential high density out of Nathorst, particularly by revisiting Ford Field. I mean, that was a big deal to take some open space and turn it into a, a very high density multifamily. Group. We've, we're trying to spread this housing out and we're trying to spread our density out as best we can mm -hmm. and put it close to the edge of town. We're trying, it's not perfect, but I hope people understand that you may not, you may get something near you you don't like, but but someone else in town that lives far from you is going to get something near them they don't like either. And that's a compromise. Um, what do you think about are, the parking lot at Roberts? Um, I would, I mean, if, if we were going, if 4394 was going to be 20 units per acre, I'd be fine with the parking lot remaining at 16 units per acre. It's a little more closer to other neighboring properties. I would, um, I mean, at some How point down zero? the line, we might have, um, or one. Or zero. Or one, zero, yeah, one. Zero, one. one just, yeah, just keeping it as it is. One. Um, I guess I could live with that. I mean, I just, I, I. I like keeping the option open, I suppose, but um, I, I, either way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the programs around the ADU and Optum, you're happy how they were laid out? Yeah, and we, you know, I, I can't remember now what's in the report, what I've discussed with people. We, we talked about sort of a rent subsidy program to reward people for actually renting an ADU or a JEDU out yeah. at the low market rate. So um, that would be something that I think would actually be giving money out for a, for performance of an act as opposed to just building, you know, subsidizing somebody's, somebody's home office or gym. Yeah. So yes, I, I do support the programs. Okay, good. Anything else you want to add? I'm good. Um, other than just thanking staff again and all of you for your work on this no thanks thanks jeff all right i'll go ahead okay uh i think that uh, from a program perspective i think what uh, laura has outlined on both the uh, adu jadu and the um opt-in uh, are are well well written well defined um on the uh the ADU, JADU, I think that, you know, Laura may already kind of have this in mind, but uh, just uh, to clarify a little bit more, I think that one of the things that would help is to almost take somebody from the planning staff and be an internal advocate for anyone who comes in with a proposal to help them walk through the bureaucracy. Um, and so you've got really somebody inside the town helping you get approvals. Um, and there, there was kind of a hint of that in what uh, Laura had written. Um, so I, I think that uh, that's just another way to try to make it a little easier for people. Um, the opt-in program, you know, I, I still think that it's, it's a reasonable approach. I would cap it so it doesn't go wild, but, you know, to me, it's, um, it's better than a SB9 split which uh, you know, is another thing that can happen and we can't control at all. Um, you know, SB9, anybody can come along and split a lot and then build a house and an ADU. And then you've got all these little, little parcels, you know, at least with uh, the opt-in program, you, uh, you have a little bit more say in what really gets built and uh, um, you still have the issue with the neighbors, but it, it's not a whole bunch more density. Than what you would get through uh, through an SB9, um, so, and then uh, Jeff's comments also about uh, you know ADUs really uh, you don't have a lot of control either. So I, I think that while it's true you don't have a lot of control with uh, um, opt in, you don't with uh, ADUs or SB9 either. And I think that that's just something we're going to have to live with. Um, and let's see. Uh, oh, the. Uh, Nathorst Triangle. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I am concerned that we're going down a path of, of too much density there. Um, I, uh, I am in favor of the upzoning to 20 units per acre at 4394 because I, I have such high confidence that that would be a uh, uh, excellent development. But if we were going to go down that path and we really believe that that was going to be a high density development, then I would put, pull off both the parking lot and the uh, the administrative offices next to it and pull them both off the list so that we 
we kept a, uh, a, a manageable density in the uh, Nat Horse Triangle. I, I, I really think that we're making a mistake if we uh, go too heavy there. I think that's all I've got. That's super helpful, Al, thank you. Uh, Sarah Wernikoff, it's getting dark behind you. I know. Yeah. So- um, the Sun coming up maybe in the same yeah. window. Yeah, uh, I definitely don't want to go over 20%. And if we have to get into rounding areas, I'd rather, you know, round down versus up. Um, I do think we'll have goodwill for things like that with Ford Field. Um, I think, um, you know, I guess in listening, you know, I think I also, as far as opt-in, I think everybody's feeling a little leery about that for all the reasons that's been said. Um, but I guess what I'm concerned about is I'm hearing, you know, less support for opt-in, um, concerns about increasing at Nat Horse, and concerns about increasing ADU. And so, if we're going to take, you know, if if opt-in, if we're going to take opt-in, decrease it, we've got to make up for it somewhere. So I guess, you know, as I'm listening to everybody, I'm I'm getting concerned that we're gonna we're not going to be able to to actually execute on everybody's preferences and still meet our number, which brings, it does bring me to, to ADUs. I'm definitely in favor of Laura pursuing that survey and maybe we can get some volunteers together to help so that we can really document what's possible there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable, you know, obviously I'm, I'm just, just one voice, but I'm comfortable with increasing it more than what's in the proposal right now. Um, particularly for moderate and above moderate. I don't think it's a great strategy for um, low and very low income um, for all the reasons that's been said. I just don't think people are gonna you know, make that investment and then not, uh, not wanna have the rent that would, would cover their, their costs there. Um, so I, I would be in favor of pushing the ADU number you know, up from where we are right now to make up for some of these deficits um, that have been kind of mentioned uh, throughout throughout the, these summaries. Um, and I think are that, you recommending, Sarah, that we? Yeah, I would. Rec I'd be in favor of opt in. So, so opt in, I'm uncomfortable with. Um, I think we should only do it if we absolutely have to, and I think it definitely would need a sunset. Um, and you know, as much rigor as we can around the structure of it. You know, the good thing about it is it, it was addressing the interest uh, amongst the community. We can't forget where we were, which was disbursement. Um, and so this was a, this is a way to get to that. There also was an interest in, you know, lower density at, you know, six units versus higher than that. And so that's, that's why we came up with the opt-in. Um, so, I would put it at my bot the bottom of my list, but um, only if if we have to do it to get the numbers to work, and and would definitely want a sunset and as much rigor around the criteria as possible. So, Laura, um, I'm curious to hear from you. If we, um, you know, this seems there's some energy around uh, not developing the the lot behind Roberts, the parking lot, I guess. Um, if we didn't have that and we didn't have opt-in, that's how many units we'd have to make up, 18 plus six, 24? Um, Carla probably has the live spreadsheet that has the, um, also with the mistake fixed in it. Yeah. So Carla, can you try to take out the um, parking lot behind Roberts and take out the opt-in and see what our numbers are? One second, trying it out right now. Do that. Why don't we go to Helen while you work on that, Carla? She's Thanks. also going to have to increase the the density on the on the net, other net. and then the nat horse go to twenty on the it one next was. to Roberts. I don't know what number that corresponds to on the. Uh, it wasn't. D E or F C D or E C C. So go to twenty there. If, if, we're, um, if we're struggling to come up with numbers, let me ask a question, which is, I heard that uh, in Atherton's submission, they had counted some SB9 units, 
partly on the basis that they have some track record now of having SB9 applications in there. But SB9 applies to Portola Valley just as much as it applies to Atherton. Would it be reasonable? Would it be you know, feasible for us to claim a small number on the basis that it's a new, broadly applicable state law? We haven't had applications yet, but there's every reason to expect we will uh, over an eight year period, certainly. And pick a number that is, you know, on a proportionate basis, half of what Atherton is claiming or something like that. Uh, it might not be a lot, but we're looking for small numbers here. Mm -hmm. Is that a reasonable thing to consider? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, uh, Atherton doesn't limit their uh, SB9 lot splits to 1,200 square feet each. So let's go to Laura. I'm curious what you think about Bill's idea. Um, I think that the way that SB9, the, the guidance that we got from HCD was very restrictive on SB9. Um, I interpreted that as they were not, you know, um, really supportive of seeing a lot of SB9 units. I think that Atherton's a little bit out on a limb, but they've got projects to back it up. Their SB9 ordinance is different than ours. Um, our SB9 ordinance um, is, is based on our ADU ordinance when it comes to state setbacks. So we were trying to discourage people to use those small four foot state setbacks. And that was really important for fire safety. So that's a really important um, policy that the town has been trying to implement, you know, the increased setbacks for fire safety. Mm -hmm. So it would really, I think, take um, a lot of work on the SB9 ordinance mm -hmm. for it to be um, encourage more units. Mm -hmm. it, it, the way that it's written, it really only meets certain people's needs for specific kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's not written to really um, widely encourage SB9 units to happen. And that's yeah. because we have so little control over them. Well, could you put in like eight or something or something small? Um, well, an SB9... An SB9 project would allow you to do a lot split and, and yeah. build two units on each of those lots, a total of four where there was one before. Yeah. So that's what's allowed. So I would almost feel more comfortable if they're to create something where we had our own um, setbacks that still applied instead of relying on or encouraging SB9 units where they can have a four foot setback. Mm -hmm. That makes me really uneasy. And does that mean oh. then by default that's ADUs? Um, no, I mean, boy, talking about, I feel like I'm kind of opening a can of worms and we, yeah. I hate to I do that at 849, okay. yeah. but we, um, you know, we created that number of six units per acre mm -hmm. um, as just a starting point. And so maybe part of this would be reducing that number to something lower, but keeping the program so that there, it would be less impactful, but You're we would still have control right over the development standards and we could still require a setback such as 30 feet when mm -hmm. SB9 mm -hmm. allows a four foot setback in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying SB9 would allow four units on a, on a property. So if we did opt-in to be four units per acre, it would be a controlled way of managing. Something of kind like of that. doing the same yeah. thing, yeah. That's interesting. What I think that's a think really that? interesting idea. It's yeah. basically a, a, a allowing SB9 in a different way and, yeah. and, and assuring that it'll count. Yeah. What do people think of that on the team here? Like it seems to me not, it seems to me not a very aggressive assumption that let's say over an eight year period three or four parcels in this in this town might be subject to an SB9 treatment. And if you have three or four parcels times potentially four units mm -hmm. uh, per parcel, well, mm -hmm. you know, you've added 12 or 15 yeah. uh, units that <clears throat> that may not, that may or may not be acceptable. Um, but it doesn't seem to me super aggressive to build that into our original mm -hmm. submission and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing I guess I like about it, if I'm understanding what you're proposing correctly, Laura, is that people can already do an SB9. So neighbors can already do that. 
And so if we have an opt-in program, maybe I'm stating the obvious that everybody else already figured out. Um, yeah. So then if we're, we're doing, is that what everybody already figured that out? Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, please, please say it so that uh, the public well, understands. And we yeah. All essentially, share. essentially we're saying that, you know, we're just creating the same opportunity as an SB nine lot split. Um, and so from a neighbor to neighbor standpoint, we're not changing what a neighbor's opportunity already th that already exists. And so that that conflict that we all are sensitive to, um, we're not adding to it because that's already an option for property owners. But we're ensuring that we have a way to regulate the, the setbacks and manage it. Right. And we're and we're making that another like tool in the toolkit. Yeah. Um, you know, for in terms of our our plan. I and mean, it can count, whereas yeah. SB9, we, we were yeah. very about it counting. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a great suggestion. Uh, objective standards, right? Yeah. I think that's a nifty idea myself. Um, so there's a couple of different ways we could think about it, right? You could do six units per acre and a maximum of six, regardless of your lot size. You could do four units per acre and a maximum of six if you have a big lot. You know what I mean? So like mm -hmm. there's kind of different ways that we could limit it so mm -hmm. that maybe we could think about how much massing would be on that lot with one big single family home and kind of within reason, make it kind of similar to that. It would have to be a little bigger, um, but we could kind of think about it from that point of view and just give people more options because part of this too is about um, the way that I view it is part of it is creating a mechanism for households that are not just going to live in one big single family home. You might have siblings, you might have parents, you might have adult children with disabilities, you might have all different reasons, your best friend, me and my friends, where you might want to live multiple people on a lot that's not just in single family housing. And there are examples of that in town and it looks great. You know, I mean, if it's, done well and in keeping with our town That's yeah so i there cool. might be like a sweet spot where it's not it's only going uh, a step further than sb9 and adu law already takes us but not like five steps further yeah. so it would just be a little incentive to people to use that program then we can regulate through development standards yeah. i think that's mm -hmm. clever laura that was a good yeah. idea it sounds like the committee's behind you on that um I, you mentioned this idea just now of doing the four per acre with a maximum of six, eh? like that kind of thing to me personally makes sense. If somebody's got three acres, they'd, they would only be, they'd be capped at six. Yeah, so I would have to think through like the different permutations yeah. um, and think about what seems practical. So yeah. to me, the priorities would be and see if these resonate. We wanna make sure that we keep um, 30 foot setbacks at least right? Because that's a kind of accepted standard right now for fire safety. We want to keep everything to the massing that we're familiar with. So some two-story components, but still setting into hills, one-story components, those types of things. Um, we want to minimize the appearance of visible parking from offsite. We want to still kind of meet the design guidelines, but maybe it could be a couple of different buildings. This goes back to Dana's point where she was talking about the zoning code wants some of the massing to be distributed around the site. Um, so I think there could be something here that we could work up mm -hmm. um, that would be that would be a mixture of these ideas. So it would be mm -hmm. a, a less, uh, I'm tired, so I'll just say scary. It's a less scary yeah. version of the opt-in. Yeah. <laughs> so Laura, do you think you would keep the current numbers as they are in the proposal or would you kind of use it as a plug after you guys go and crunch things, summarizing what we're hearing tonight. I think we'd use it as the plug after we right. crunch the numbers. I need to yeah. go up a little. Carla, how did that look doing the so taking out the parking lot and mm -hmm. going to 20 at that one? So at the vacant lot, if you do 20, you can get up to 23 units. Mm -hmm. So, and then I took out the five that we had for the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so now we just have an excess in one of the income categories. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's going beyond the 20% mm -hmm. buffer. Mm -hmm. um, but we can, because it's 20, 20 units per acre, we can assume it's low income, but we don't have to call it lower income. 
Mm -hmm. We can distribute it differently. So how do our total units look, Carla? We're at 315. Mm. Okay. So I think then if, I mean, there probably needs to be more discussion and we still have hands up, but maybe what we do is kind of put some of these things in the priority order, which I think we've mostly done already. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think for most people, opt-in is at the bottom and then we'll only use the opt-in if we need it once we work with the numbers and we'll design the opt-in to limit it more so that it's kind of just a step beyond SB9 mm -hmm. and then still kind of keep the um, process and everything that we laid out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds good. And it sounds like you've got support on the uh, programs themselves that you laid out. Um, yeah, so okay. Helen, did you have another point you wanna make? I did. Uh, thank you. Um, really quickly, uh, people were talking about supporting um, ADU with town money for ADU if they agreed to rent to low income. Um, I would also encourage if town money is going to be used for non affordable housing units, I would encourage it's hard to access state money for uh, the uh, the initial permitting and planning process of ADUs, and I would encourage some town money to be used there then, because it, because of uh, somehow because of high, being a high resource resource community, it's hard to qualify for for that state money. So I just wanted to mention that I I personally would rather the money go into affordable low and very low income affordable housing units personally than ADU but I wanted to mention that in case that was still on the table. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Janie Ward. Hey. Hi. I am glad that I didn't speak and listened this whole time because I really am appreciative of all your ideas and especially, Laura, the work that you all have done at the town is amazing. Um, I really like this idea that was just suggested um, to kind of deal with the opt-in program. I think that's a sweet spot, a really good solution um, because I think the regulations uh, make it more palatable and something that you know makes more sense to me. And I think I've always been uh, my position to distribute housing throughout the town it makes the most sense. I'm not in favor. I think at priori my our units were about 17 um, in our little community. And I was happy to see the Sequoias came into the tour yesterday and like knocked on the door and wanted to come inside <laughs> and see where we live. So um, we're happy to um, welcome anyone to come and visit and you know see how we've done it and built community. Um, one of the things I, I keep putting out there that I think might be a good idea is a community development organization of some sort where we can control the development and create, um, you know, village within a village has been said, eco housing, you know, have design insurance, things like that. There's plenty of money here in town. Uh, we built a new town center. I think we could do the same thing on a grander scale because my understanding is to bring a developer in for this kind of housing is what 50 units is the number I keep hearing. Like the, the priory six units was I think 6 million. So, you know, it's either an altruistic developer or we take development in, into our own hands. And I kind of feel like the same with ADUs. And, um, you know, it's a generous person to build an ADU and charge low rent, right? Because they're not going to really get their investment back. So anyway, just some things I've been thinking about, but I'm really happy to hear that we've come so far in these discussions. And again, I applaud you, Laura, and the town um, staff and um, you guys who at Urban Planning Partners too for getting us to this point. And thank you for everybody. Okay. Thanks, Janie. Uh, Sarah Dorahy, have you had a chance to chime in? I have not, but everything's no? been covered. Chime I think. away. I'm gonna chime, listen to me chime. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, I've said already, I'm in favor of, if we can sprinkle in a few more ADUs and um, we'll take away the whole brownie points thing and we'll call it a show of good faith that we're actually doing something. It's not brownie points. It's actually fulfilling a mandate and doing what we're supposed to do, which is coming up with low income housing. So I would feel really good about doing that. So hopefully um, maybe the ADU number could be pushed up a little bit. This new hybrid, whatever we want to call it, I'd love a snappy name for it. Not opt-in, not SB9, but it's a, a merging of the two, but m even better. Because we get to have our, I, if I've understood correctly, we can apply our objective stringent design standards to whatever gets built and that makes me happy. So that's a good thing. Um, 
<laughs> now, to hysteria, yes, if we can avoid overloading that space, then of course I would be 100% in favour. So, you know, and even with the potential of a 20 unit development on that vacant lot next to the Willow Commons, I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. It just means that it's there. So the it's option is there. Providing for flexibility, it. really. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's not, doesn't mean it's happening. It just means that, you know, it's an option. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else? No, just, again, we just have to make the most of our objective standards and do things well in the Patola Valley way. And I applaud Laura and her team for all kinds of incredible jumping through hoops. Yeah. And I don't envy anybody who has to, not negotiate, but present anything to a big, large government body like HCD. I think that would be a very difficult job to do. So I applaud you for everything you're doing to make that happen. And um, what else? I'm not saying anything new, so I'll chime out. Thanks, <laughs> Thank you for chiming in and chiming out. <laughs> that was great. Anybody else want to chime in or chime out? <laughs> I think we're all ready to chime out right about now. Laura Russell, do you have okay. a name? So I'm going to try to summarize and then okay. please add in if I haven't captured everything. But okay. I think this is where the consensus is now. Right. Um, we are going to take the empty lot um, next to Roberts, I forget the address, um, and change that to 20 units per acre. We're going to remove the parking lot behind Roberts from the site inventory. Then we, staff consultant team, are going to go in and look at the numbers and kind of see if we can move the ADUs around a little bit, see how the totals are looking. Um, and we are going to aim for um, having right at the 20% buffer, or if there's a rounding issue, we're going to round down a little bit. So maybe one's at 20 and one's at 18%, which is still within the 15% buffer that's in the HCD written guidelines. Instead of going up, we'll just go down a little bit um, because of we believe we have the good faith showing with the Ford Field development. If we are still short of units, then we will create an opt-in program with, we'll try to think of a snappy name, but we may not have a snappy name, but we won't call it this, we'll think of something that is more limited than the opt-in program that's in the partial draft right now, but would still seek to disperse some units around the community and still have strong objective standards. And we'll fill in whatever that hole is with that program once we've kind of reconstituted it. So does that sound like um, the right summary? Yeah, and then it sounds great. As far as I'm concerned, anybody see anything that we, we left out or had? Oh, that no, sounds I, right. I did forget. I, I would like to put in a plug for horses. I don't have one. I don't ride them, but I like seeing them around town. And I, it, it's, you know, even though we're not classified really as a rural town, um, it feels pretty rural to me. And I'd like it to stay that way. And if we can, with our new snappy terminology category, um, keep our horses where they are, then I think that would be a bonus too. Which leads me to the Glen Oaks. Right now on the proposal, we've got uh, three low income, two moderate, 27 above moderate, total of 32. Um, what's your feeling about that now, Laura, after this discussion? Um, so this goes back a few hours, but there was conversation about the Alpine corridor and the intensity of development along that corridor. So we still have Ford Field on the list. We still have Ladera Church across the street. The Stanford project at the Wedge is currently under review and included in pending. And Glen Oaks is on the list for eight units per acre. That is a significant change to the entrance of the town along Alpine. It, it is, I think, I think most people would agree with that. Um, so I think we have heard from the public and nothing contrary that we wanna make sure we keep the scenic corridor setback. So we would not allow any infringement into the scenic corridor setback because that's something we talked about, I don't know, months ago. So that seems like it's important to keep that. The question is um, for Glen Oaks, I think, this is off the cuff, but I think it's unlikely to see both development there and horses stay unless a horse 
operation could still happen. It's some like the smaller portions, like there's kind of a bigger section of it and then there's a smaller portion. So that might be possible. Um, I could think about if there's any crafty, I don't know, zoning tricks. I've never heard of a horse boarding bonus, but maybe we could give a floor area bonus if they keep horses. I'm making this up. I've never heard of such a thing, but I don't know. There's floor area bonuses for other things. Um, so we can at least see if there's any best practice or any like out of the box ideas we can throw at this to try to keep that. Um, I think from a practical point of view, that 32 units that we have at Glen Oaks is about right. If from real life, it might turn out to be a little less. Um, so if you're concerned about the scenic corridor and we reduce Glen Oaks a little bit, it might mean we do a little bit more opt-in, but maybe opt-in is now more agreeable since we've mm -hmm. modified it. Right. That's, oh, I'd love, I'd love like a fair trade-off to me. I'm wondering what the committee thinks about that. Yeah. We don't really have any other policy around the town that is in the interest of protecting horses, do we? I mean, I've, I've, I've lived here almost 30 years and in the process, there have been dozens of barns eliminated just within walking distance of my house. Mm -hmm. And that's happened without any great offense to public policy, is there? I, I mean, I'm, I mean, sure, I, I think it, other things being equal, having horses around is kind of a nice thing, but in some ways the town crossed this bridge a long time ago. And you know what, what used to be dozens of barns are now dozens of ADUs. It seems to me the ship has kind of sailed. Or large homes. Mm -hmm. yeah. but you're also, you know, undoing a business. Right? Oh, okay, sure. But it's a business. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I've walked past there all the time. It's not exactly buzzing <laughs> with yeah. anything other than the flies that associated with the horses. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I, I, I can't get too worked up about it, honestly. <laughs> So I'd like to hear people, Al, you've got your hand up, but I'm, I'm going to go. Yeah. Back. I'm just um, thinking like, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that Alpine corridor and how things are sort of playing out here. Um, and yeah. the Glen Oaks. Yeah, go ahead, Al. Um, yeah, I think that this is going to come down to trading off three different properties or three different proposals. I think, you know, density at, um, Nat Horse, density at Glen Oaks, or the opt-in, the new, whatever we call it, the new opt-in. Those three things are gonna be the, the things that have to get traded off. And, you know, from my point of view, a, I'd rather see development at Glen Oaks and second would be opt-in and third would be any additional, you know, I think that the 20 units at uh, at Nathorse uh, on 4394 Alpine is okay, but I really think we ought to not have any other development there um, so that we manage the, the increased development in that area. And I, I think that that would mean not developing the administrative offices or the, the uh, parking lot behind Roberts. Um, I think that there's just gonna be too much going on there if we put the big 20 unit development at 4394 and then develop one of those other parcels too. So, you know, to me, I would rather see development at Glen Oaks and a uh, new creative opt-in type program and then limit what we do at Nathorse would be my uh, preferences. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly can imagine that not everybody's gonna see it that way. I just think that we, we have to be mindful of uh, overdoing it at uh, the Nat Horse Triangle. Jocelyn, you were muted just now. I believe you don't read my lips. I was saying, Jeff, <laughs> any other comments? Anne? Oh, sorry. I was, I was responding. Yeah, go ahead, um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I don't, you know, I, I, um, 
this is one of the hard decisions we're having to make right now. And I mean, I, you know, the, the, the Alpine corridor, I, I, as, I mean, I, I value that drive home every day, just like anyone else does, but there are reasons why we're looking at that area for development. And a lot of them have to do with just safety and access. And um, we're making some tough trade-offs. Uh, and like Al said, I mean, I, I do not want to concentrate this all in one neighborhood in town. And so, you know, Nathorst, we, we started out looking at Nathorst and I want to move things away, but that means making some, some tough decisions. So I, I do think that the, the stand, I, I, I think Glen Oaks, I, I think it probably does have to remain on the list as far as I'm concerned, because it's just, there's just not many other places where we can put sort of a comparable number of houses in a place that's reasonably accessible and reasonably safe. Yeah. I think I think for me, um, you know, I don't. Th we're obviously we can't get rid of Glen Oaks. We just there's just we have too much inventory at that location. I'd be interested, at Laura, when you guys pencil it out, if there's ways to decrease it by increasing ADUs. That would that would be. I agree with Al's comment that we're really down to these three locations, and um, I think it's just finessing the numbers as you guys get into the details there. And I think the the property next to Roberts, uh, I think it's just as likely that it would be less than 20 units as it would be 20 units. I mean, I, I just don't think that there's a plan there yet. So it could be half of that or something or even less. Um, um, and personally, like I really like what they're doing with Willow Commons. I really trust that they're gonna do a top quality project that's going to fit into Portola Valley and be low impact as possible. Um, so I like betting on that one. Yeah, Janie. Sorry, I may have missed this before, but did Glen Oaks or do they have plans to build uh, employee housing or would this be completely unrelated? I, they were never in our affiliate program, correct? Stanford is in our affiliated housing program. But I mean the, the horse operation. Oh, the horse operation, no, it's unfortunately complicated. No, I think our, our general plan is a little confusing right now. I think no, it's not included. Um, they would likely build faculty and staff housing with an affordable component. Okay, so would there be, like, like uh, just to be clear, would there be a way to still maintain some like modified smaller horse building facilities and keep that business intact and then still could build housing adjacent to their facility or no? I, I, I think it's unlikely. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Anybody else? So I think the issue is, are we decreasing um, the number of units at Glen Oaks? So I think it stays on the list, but are we decreasing the number of units? So the, the only thing that I would add, we haven't talked about in terms of looking ahead. If we get strong comments back from HCD, that will mean in the fall, we're gonna have to do a quick revision. Mm -hmm. And so everyone is gonna have to be aware that some of these things you're taking off the table now could come back. Mm -hmm based on Fair. HCD comments. So yeah, we wanna be thoughtful about the expectations of the community and this committee that we're taking it off now, we're taking a little risk with ADUs, we might have to put these things back on. Yeah, sure. no, that's fair. And I think that's good to put everybody on notice that that's the case. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's what we were kind of talking about earlier, um, at least I was when I was talking about, you know, we, we should keep something at, at, that's potentially out there that like the Roberts, I mean, sorry, like the the parking lot at a low de lower density, like six six units, or you know something that we have in our back pocket in the event that we need it. Mm -hmm. And so, if we shaved uh, some off of the Glen Oaks number, a few, you said would you know, sir, can make a difference on the massing. That's another area where we could add that back in. If we needed to. Can I make a quick comment about Laura? What you just said about um, might we might have to do a quick revision in the fall. Um, it's for that reason that I'd like to see us um, uh, be aggressive with ADUs now. Um, a number of residents have have uh, asserted that it'd be pretty easy to get a large number of um, people to commit to ADUs. Um, to to go in with our first iteration with a list of a, a hundred residents who are committed to. Um, 
uh, build a junior AD, or, uh, junior ADU or, or, or add an ADU in the next eight years. And so um, not to belabor the point because I've made it and others have made it, but it seems like now would be the time to be aggressive with ADUs, as aggressive as possible. And perhaps, you know, people in the community could um, uh, do the legwork of, of compiling, you know, data like that. Uh, HCD apparently wants persuasive evidence. It seems like that would be pretty persuasive. Laura, do you think we could um, do some kind of survey around this in parallel to this process going on? Yeah, we can do a survey um, during the few months when HCD is reviewing our first draft. Yeah. So if they come back and say, you need more evidence for ADUs, we'll immediately have it. Yeah. So, but we, there's, I mean, it can definitely be a role for volunteers. Um, and I was actually talking to Judy Murphy about this because she volunteered some of her time and she's, I mean, like highly qualified um, volunteer, yeah. but um, we have to kind of keep some containment around it because at a certain point, you know, it'll turn into a crazy exercise. Yeah. No, it's right. got to be managed by the town or it's going to be, you know, this rogue effort going on, which isn't helpful to any of us. So it's got to be managed by the town. But then I think you could do a call for a few volunteers if you needed them to help do what you needed help with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't need just people going off and doing it. Yeah. And it has to include enough information so that people can make a decision too. Right, because if, if so you just ask someone, do you want to build an ADU? They say, yes. And you say, yeah. do you want to build an ADU? It's going to cost $900,000. Right. Then right. the answer is probably going to be no. Right. If, if we're saying, and then would you rent it for 1,600 a month? Right. I think right. the answer is going to be more, no more often than people realize. Right. Uh, which, which is why you shouldn't do a survey and then find out you don't like the answer you got. That's always the risk with doing a survey, right? If, you, if you're doing a rigorous survey that's asking people hard questions, you might get a disappointing result. And at that point, you're stuck with that. So mm -hmm. let's be thoughtful before we do this stuff. Also, I don't see why HCD would count this. There's too much incentive for everybody to say, yeah, yeah, I'll build one, I'll build one. Well, let's get our again, number unless, lower. Unless, unless they were making a commitment and you, that. But the, the, the firmer you make it, the less likely you are to get an affirmative answer. And so if that's why I'm skeptical that this survey thing is gonna be helpful to us. Either we'll get a high affirmative answer to a meaningless question, or we'll get a lot of negatives to a really stern question. And neither of those is gonna help us. Uh, what, what's in my mind is a prepaid uh, pre-application. Um, I, I don't know how many there would be, um, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that if there were 100, uh, that would be compelling to HCD. It's my, but, my So that's the, a good point, though. Like, it's, to me, it's not the application fees. It's the cost of building it, and that is close right. to a million bucks. So. <laughs> and when people realize the septic sewer problem, right, that costs a ton of money, I, I yeah. think people kind of great intentions yeah but the devil's in the detail on this yeah. issue yeah it's a super expensive proposition super expensive. Yeah. if i were hcd and i was being approached by every town that it's going to pretend it's going to provide its low-income housing ready to use i would not take this very seriously i would look at what are the rate you produced it in the last eight years what are Thank the you. rate that other towns have produced it in the last eight years what's changed since your topography is very difficult, much more difficult than Atherton, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so why should I believe that you're not just trying to duck this requirement? Right. I also do not think it is a desirable policy to pretend we're not we're, we're going to satisfy all of our low-income housing with junior ADUs. So junior ADUs are not realistic housing for most people. Um, it's it, what it is. It's a return on investment for the for the owners. Um, so they have another, they have more square footage and they have another unit, so but that's really not where need... people want to live in Portola Valley. Yeah. They don't want to live in somebody's uh, basement. So, um, I don't, I don't think we're just, we can't push this any farther than reason will allow and HCD I'm sure will not allow us to do that either. I mean, I like the, the programs around the ADU that were suggested, you know, where we're matching people and, um, you know, Hopefully, 
because I don't think to date we've really had much um, relief for affordable housing from the 80s in town, right? And so that's our understanding that we talked about in the beginning of our meetings. Right. Um, but I'm maybe wondering with these programs around it, we could actually get some of that happening. But yeah. Right. And I, 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 I would just like, point, I just looked at rentals on Zillow. And once again, there's one in Woodside, there's not one rental for rent in a two or three bedroom for under $5,000. There's not one. So I'd be, just as Xander said, I would be very cautious, even though the 30% will count towards lower, low income, I would be very cautious about going that route. So I just want to mention again, I don't, I don't, think that we should increase our low, low or very low income ADUs. I don't think that that's a good thing to do for all the reasons that have been said. When I, when I mentioned increasing, it was for moderate and above moderate. I think we're going to be able to get our, our, um, you know, hit the numbers through our other, um, you know, Ford field and whatnot mm -hmm. um, for the low and very low. Mm -hmm. So I just one more um, reminder on this. Remember that ADUs, people are allowed to build ADUs with a four foot setback with certain restrictions. So that's the flip side of encouraging um, a lot more ADUs is we could have more units at four foot setbacks. Can I say another, um, if I were HCD, another argument not to count, be so aggressive on counting ADUs is when the town, we revisited our ADU policy a few years ago and made it more liberal. You know, there's some people that just wish they had more square footage. We had one guy come and he has a cheese uh, making hobby. So he wanted to build an ADU so he could have space for the cheese making, you know? So it's possible to build an ADU, but it's never going to get rented. And it's a way for rich people to, you know, 6,000 square feet isn't big enough. Oh, now they can have 7,000 square feet. So, you know, of course, plenty and plenty of people rent their ADUs, but not everybody. It, it takes a generation. That's why when you go to London, people live in those mused houses, which were used to be stables. Well, they were yeah, ADUs yeah. of their time. It's just that a hundred years later, people live in them. But right. We probably don't have that kind of time window right. to do. And I agree with that. And that's one reason we liberalized it, right? Yeah people's so, lives change right and their parents get older and then they move in to the cheese place <laughs> so laura do we need to make any further conclusions here or do you think we're good okay so i feel like we're still kind of split on whether we okay. should increase adus any more than what's on the draft materials you have i would i would vote against that i don't need to support that I don't, do, I just don't do think so of hands of people that feel like we should uh, increase the number of ADUs, raise your hand. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure because it, it, for me, it kind of depends on how the numbers pencil out a little bit. I mean, I do think we should, we should um, target our buffer for as close to 20% without going over as possible. And that might end up resulting in a slight change in the ADU numbers, but I, I, I that would be my, my only kind of wiggle, you know, I, I think we need to give ourselves that wiggle room on ADU, ADU numbers. I am not in favor of increasing them significantly. And I kind of go along with that as well because of the realistic, uh, you know, likelihood that we, they'll actually get built. Um, right. I mean, I think it's a bit of a pipe dream that you're going to build something for a million dollars and rent it for 1500 a month. Yeah, I agree with I what was just said, too. Another reason why I'm, I'm, I'm um, supportive of it is because of the amnesty program. Supportive of what? Uh, increasing ADUs. I do think the amnesty program will bring more ADUs forward um, in a real way. And again, I'm not talking about a huge increase, but I think to, to put it on the list for some increase to make the numbers work out. So I do support the amnesty, sorry. I do support the amnesty part. And yeah. also, as someone mentioned, it might've been the very wise Jeff House at a previous meeting, all those many, many months ago. One, they might not be used now and it might not be a hundred years like the news houses, but they could be used in five years time or six years time as people are downsizing and you, you, know, you wanna use an extra unit for, for somebody or your circumstances change and you need the extra rent. 
I mean, if they get built, you know, eventually someone will live in them. So, you know, that's another point of view to take. I'm not hearing though, like strong support for increasing ADUs by much. We've no, already, I, would, I would not. We've pushed it up from 50 something to 92. That seems like a big jump to me. We were at 88. We were at 88. Strongly, uh, strongly disagreeing. Why we started at it. We started at 80. So that was staff's first recommendation was 80. Okay, we're at 92 now, right? People are good with that around yeah. that number. I know it's kind of a plug number, right? There's opt in more the plug number. I I think I think we should be more aggressive. Um, I think we should gather data that supports it and uh, be more aggressive with it. Okay. So you just throw a, a hand up. up so you know for sure, Jocelyn? Yeah, I was trying to do that and we kind of got derailed. So <laughs> if you want to increase the ADU number, raise your hand, please. So I got one, two, three, four. Helen, is that a hand up or you're itching no. your nose? No. So four people. Okay. Anything Helen else, Laura? I think we're done. So we're not going to increase the ADUs based on that count. Then I'm going to, we're going to work everything through the way that we talked about that I summarized earlier. Mm -hmm. Then, um, because this committee won't see it again until there's a full draft. Mm -hmm. So we're going to um, just kind of finalize these numbers. Um, if we need to do a check-in, um, we'll do a check-in with um, Sarah and Jeff as the council um, uh, subcommittee. And we'll check in with Jocelyn as Al as the chair and the vice chair. Um, so I just want people to know that if staff needs to do a check in as we're working on this, that's how we're going to do that. Um, just to get any kind of little clarifying feedback. And then um, we'll have the full draft housing element. We'll send it out to everybody once it's ready so that you have it. And you've got plenty of time to spend with it um, before we review it at our June meeting. So the next meeting for us is going to be June 20th, right? Yes. At 4.30 Pacific time. Yes. So everybody get on your calendars and that's reviewing the final draft. Yeah, we're, well, let's refer to that as the public review draft. Public review draft. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. It's, you said June 7th, right? June 20th. Uh, June 20th for our next meeting of this group. Thank you. And by that time, it'll have already been reviewed by the Planning Commission, right? Yes. Or, the Planning Commission will have already seen it. Planning Commission's June 15th, Town Council's after our meeting on June 29th. Correct. Yeah. We're making progress. We're getting there. This is a very difficult process and there are a lot of tough trade-offs. Um, it's, it's uh, complex, but I commend all of you to just hanging in there and providing all your valuable insights and advice. Thank you. Right. Sorry, it's Thank so you, late. Laura. Thank you, Josh. I missed our target um, by three and a half hours. I'd still like to approve the minutes. We need to, we, yeah. we need to approve minutes. <laughs> can we approve okay. minutes? We can do it with one motion if there's no um, changes. Please make a motion, somebody. So moved. Okay. Seconded. Okay, um, we do have to take any public comments on the minutes. Any public comments on the minutes and nothing but the minutes. Lonnie. Sorry, I don't know if this, this is on the minutes, but. It has uh, to be on the minutes, Lonnie. No. What are the minutes? Only is, that taking comments on the minutes. is that what we just discussed? So the I, minutes are in the packet from the last meeting. If you don't have any comments on that, then I'm sorry. Okay, so it's thinking. not what we recently discussed no. because I feel like I need to address no. something that's. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay, that's all right. I'll address it on the forum because it needs to be addressed and that's I'll send awesome. it to you in an email. Thank you very much. Appreciate oh. your participation. Okay, looks like no comments on the minutes. Meeting adjourned. Oh, wait, a we vote. Need, we, need to vote. we have a motion oh, and a oh, second. I always forget the vote. <laughs> so just say all in favor. All in favor of a Approving the minutes, yeah. Aye. And, and any opposed? Everybody's got their hands up. 
Anybody opposed? No. Okay, no opposed. Got it. Thank now you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night, all. Good job. Good night. Nice job, Laura. Thank you. Yes, good job. <laughs>